Second. Mr. Becker, we're now live on YouTube. Okay. Thank you. Um, welcome to the curriculum committee meeting tonight, Monday, uh, May 17th. We have a couple things we just need to go over. Um, nothing earth shattering, just some minor things that we need to talk about. Um, under curriculum, the first thing is the math series, and I know I brought this up before. We are looking um, to revise our math series, hopefully grades K through 6. Um, next school year, we'll be bringing in representatives or virtually same representatives um, to look at different math programs. I do currently have the Into Math, which on Ed Reports was one of the highest rated programs. Um, I do have their samples here. I did talk to the rep. We are going to set something up um, to have our teachers go through a session with them just to see what the program is about. And then what will happen is we'll do exactly what we did with the reading series. We'll have the teachers vote. We'll you know, go through a series of representatives, look at different programs, and then have the teachers vote, talk about the pros, cons of each system, and then decide from there. We're hoping to implement in 22-23. Um, and that, that's wrong on the thing, 22, 23. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to go full K through six the first year or we'll do a roll up. It depends on the topics and what, what we might be missing if we just go all in. Um, because especially with math, it's a build upon, so I hate to have them miss something. Um, so, we, you know, and I talked to the teachers, I said what we'll do is we'll look at each program, we'll look at what's missing in each grade level or what would they, the students would be missing and see if we'd be able to fill that in. If not, then we'll kind of roll it up um, grade level by grade level. Um, I'm also looking for new biology books. Our biology books are super, duper, really old, um, falling apart. We had to buy a couple this past year. Um, they're in really, really rough shape. Plus, I, I don't think we've purchased any in a, a good bit of time. Um, so I did get um, a quote for biology books from, which used to be Pearson, is now Savas. Um, and they look like they're, they, they, they come highly recommended. I got a quote for 30 books in the classroom and then six years of online licenses, which I thought would be nice because then they can do it from home. They, can, they don't have to carry the biology book back and forth with them. So we're looking at that. Um, I've only gotten one quote so far on biology books. Uh, so that's you know still up in the air. We haven't decided anything on that yet. So those are the two big things under curriculum. Um, under instruction, I do want you to know that I did um, submit the accounting career path pathway application which was the accounting one that we, we spoke about moving from ninth, you know, basically starting in ninth grade up to 12th grade, and then we would have an articulation agreement with last. Teachers did have another um, training session on May the 14th. We do have one more training session on June the 1st, our last day, uh, the teacher last day, the F80 day. Um, and that was all that we've paid for. So we've gotten all the professional development that we had previously paid for, especially with last year being COVID and not being here. So it ended up, we did get all of our PD in, which is nice. The, um, the last two sessions, the teachers chose topics, um, which were they thought were relevant to them, things that they needed maybe more information on or needed a little bit more guidance on. Um, so it, it's been working out really well. They've been virtual, all virtual, so they just log on. Um, Michelle is the uh, rep that does the training for us, and they just log on virtually and you know converse that way. It's been working out really great. Um, Brian has shared, had shared with myself and the administrator some new Microsoft things that were coming out with Mac and ELA. So that's something that we're going to look at on June 1st as well. Uh, I played a, a little bit with the math. Um, it, it looks phenomenal. So there are some things that we're going to kind of pull in on June the 1st to kind of have teams of teachers look at. As far as the Girl Star program, we do have nine students, uh, nine girls in grades three and four that have signed up for the summer camp. I did um, send all the registrations to um, Kelsey and she's uploading them. I don't know where she uploads them, but she said she just will upload all the information and then keep us posted. Um, she did contact me and I contacted Brie and Josh about places to stay here and which airport to fly into. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you guys kind of knew that a little bit better than I did. So we're, we're getting this, their staff sent in. Um, so that's really cool. Uh, I know the girls were really excited about it. A couple of girls that I had talked to that were in the spring session were very excited that they were having a summer session as well. I was hoping to have more than nine. Um, but that's all we have so far. I didn't get any from Function of Beauty. I did email Randy. Um, he said that it was still in, you know, hung up and advertised, but I hadn't heard anything about any of, of their children wanting to come. Girls, girls going. Girls going, going currently in third and fourth grade, so going into fourth and fifth grade. There was reaching out that maybe schools to offer. Uh, we could. Is that something? I, I know. I I just wasn't sure with like. Like insurances and like liability, like are we okay? Okay. Should we do that? 
I think we're going to send this to certain schools. Smoking no alcohol will make the most sense. teacher for next school year. We do have four EL students. Hannah, who was our EL person this year, um, she finished her student teaching. So the past two weeks, we've just been having them work on an online program, which is helpful, but not enough. So we are going to look to, and I talked to Teresa about, you know, advertising for at least a part-time person. I don't know if we'll find anybody. Mm -hmm. I, I I'm, we'll just have to play. I don't know if anybody has any suggestions. EL is tough. It, it is, a, it's a tough, and I don't, we don't, we don't have anybody on staff now that is staying that will be able to do the EL program for us so we're just going to have to kind of figure that out for next school year it's, that's a tough one um, as far as assessment we finished all PSSA assessments we do I do have two students that have makeup so they're coming with me this week um, they'll be so all PSSAs will be completed by the end of this week which is nice um, no issues it worked, went smoothly um, the students that were here did great the students that were virtual came in and took the test um, they either took it in the classroom with their, you know, homeroom teachers, or they came and took it with me. Uh, they, it's been great so far. We did start Keystone today, so today started that biology and the literature Keystone. Um, tomorrow was supposed to be bio and lit, but I guess we'll be putting that off probably till Wednesday. <laughs> now it's being virtual tomorrow. Um, and algebra is supposed to be Thursday and Friday. We did have um, some of our students who are virtual again, or some of our cyber students, they did come in to take the test. I had seven kids in today in the computer lab. I have five coming in tomorrow. And I did call them and tell them that they can still come tomorrow because I'm testing in the elementary school, so we're fine. So everybody was good with that. Um, but the Keystone seems to be rolling along. Um, we do, they're all online, um, which is nice. So they all log on to the system. They log into PDE. They get into DRC inside and take the test. Um, it's actually really convenient doing it online. But they, they should be done, I'm going to say, hopefully by the end of next week. I do, I personally have some students coming in next week that want a small group. Um, and to, some will be away from other, you know, the masses of students. So we should be done those, I'm hoping, by mid to late next week. Um, we did talk, and Jen and I had talked about summer remediation, the summer program. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we are still in the works with that. We've been collecting data. Um, all of our students in grades K through four have gone through or will go through. They have, you know, some of them haven't been here, so we've been trying to catch them up virtually. Um, the Dibbles test, so they take the reading and the math. We also, in grades K and one, and our high risk students in two and three, we've given them the Hegarty test, which is a phonemic awareness test. Also, in grades one through four, um, we're giving them the Dibbles Deep Quick Screener, which is basically like a, a quick sight word. Um, vocabulary kind of thing where they, they read the words as quickly as they can to see how far they can cut. Um, our fourth grade students are also taking the study on and benchmark test in both um, ELA and in math. Our fifth through eight students, and I can give you this sticky, I have it. <laughs> our fifth through eight are doing um, the study island as well in both reading and math. And then also our fifth and sixth grades were dibbling them, um, which we hadn't done in the past. I know it sounds like <laughs> I dibbled them. Um, <laughs> So we haven't done that in the past, but we are doing that in both reading and math. Now with the reading, they do um, a maze, which is basically comprehension. There's reading and then there's boxes they have to pick the best word in, in a certain amount of time. And then we're also doing an oral reading fluency where they have to read to somebody for one minute to see how far they can get and how quickly they can read. So those are all being done. Um, they started them last week, we're working on this week and hopefully into next week. That'll give us some data on who we think might need some extra remediation over the summer. Um, we're going to put all of that into a spreadsheet so we can see, you know, Stephanie Zygmunt did this, 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 and this, and kind of, you know, go across all of the data to see where I fell, what I am weak in, what I am I'm, I'm strong in. Um, and then we'll make recommendations for who would be beneficial to come over the summer. Now, again, even though we have the summer program, we can't make it mandatory. We could highly suggest that students come, um, but we, we can't make it mandatory. But I'm hoping that a lot of students take advantage of that. Um, it will be for the month of July. I think it starts on, I think it starts July 6th. It was an 8.30 to 11.30. Um, so it'll be three hours a day, Monday through Thursday. Is um, the results result immediate? Um, we do, well, yes and no. Um, so when we put K through four, we, we pay for dibbles. So when we put the information in, we get results right away. So I already, we've already looked at a lot of the results. 
the math I have to put in manually, actually just before I was putting, so I have to go in and say, you know, Drew did number one, he is A, number two, he is B, number three, he is C. So I have to go put those in manually, so those are taking a little bit longer. We don't pay for the fifth and sixth grade students, so those are all going to be done by hand. So I have the Title I teachers already started correcting those and looking at those. Um, I plan on next year having dibbles from K through six because it is only a dollar a student. So I'm thinking another $200. I know it's $200, but it's, I think it's worth it. That way we can do it three times a year with them as well and just collect more data throughout the year. And the Dibble's results, is that accessible by parents? Or is that um, the parents? parents are actually going to get a report at the end of the school year with, we, I just talked to Title I, they're going to see their beginning, middle, and end score for K-4, <laughs> um, the, the beginning, middle, and end score for both reading and math, so they'll be able to see how their students did. Um, we do send that data home with our Title I students. Um, we don't send it home with everybody, but at the end of the year, we are going to send it home with everybody so they can see it. Yeah. I think so too. I think, I think so too. Good, especially if, if especially if they're thinking about the summer. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. No, I completely agree with you. Um, so that's where we're at with that. Um, as far as federal programs, Title One, um, we did not have a parent involvement portion this year because of COVID. So our parent involvement is going to be the, the uh, Title I teachers created um, parent involvement packets that go home with the students over the summer. It's interventions and remediation and fun games. It's, it's kind of a learning fun way of doing it, but it's something that they're gonna go home with every student, even though only certain ones were titled, we're gonna send it home with every student because we are school wide, so that way we cover everybody. Um, and it's just things that the parents can do with the students over the summer. Um, a lot, I was looking at some of them, it's cute, it's like a, you know, you know, uh, begin color the beginning sounds with be red or blue or you know, things like that, which are fun but yet educational at the same time, just to kind of get our parents working with the students over the summer as well. Um, and honestly, that's all I have. I didn't really have a whole lot. <laughs> Do you guys have any questions? I have a question. So, um, STEM stuff in summer. I'm not super familiar with it. The, the girls okay. start? Yeah. Okay, yeah. it's a it's a coding camp for, for girls only in going into fourth and fifth grade, so current third and fourth graders. It is um, for a week in June. Um, they come every day. Um, they send staff from Texas, like we don't run it, we just give a facility basically. Um, so they come from Texas. And I, I was actually, we did a spring one um, because we were doing the summer one. They had some openings for the spring, so they asked if we wanted to be involved. So I had actually sat in on a couple of their lessons, and it, it's really actually really neat stuff. The one student I was talking to, um, she she's a current third grader. No, I'm lying, current fourth grader, so she'll be in fifth grade next year. And she was super excited about it. She was telling me all about this NASA thing, and, and she's she wants to work for NASA. So <laughs> she was hoping that there was going to be a summer thing, and she was literally the first person that signed up. And it was funny because as soon as I got the application, I sent it right to her mom. I'm like, I'm sure that your daughter's going to want this, so here's the application right away. But they do a lot of um, like engineering things and a lot of coding things. It's, it's actually really, I only set it on a little bit of it, and then I talked to Itzel. Do you? Oh, I thought you had something. Um, I talked to Itzel, who's the, one of the ladies who runs it. Um, and they just, they meet. Uh, they, during the school year, they met like once a week from like 3 to like 4.30, mm -hmm. um, but in the summer it'll be a full week that the girls will come here and their oh, staff will come here. So, it's neat. Girlstart.org has all the details. Yeah. They're a, a national. Yeah, they're national from Texas. Um, yeah. Um, so. Nonprofit, um, empowering girls in science, technology, mm -hmm. engineering, and math. Yeah, we, um. I'm new to the job that I have now, but I know last summer we also ran, I think it was maybe for high school students, it was a female summer STEM camp that we ran. And one of the new consultants that I just picked up, she actually was a physics teacher at Chickalini. Uh -huh. um, I mean, she taught computer science, physics, you know, like all of that. Everything, everything, <laughs> <Damn it. laughs> biology, um, and she's extremely passionate in promoting you know, women within the STEM field, mm -hmm. uh, but if you're looking for another resource, okay. you really great. Right. Yeah. No, that's great. And I know with Girl Start, they they actually talked about different women in different mm -hmm. positions, and kind mm -hmm. of. So that was. It, I think it gives girls something to, to look for, a model to look at. And actually, kind of on that same, she's part of a national organization. I don't really recall what it is, but that's what it's all about. Is training teachers to promote women in STEM careers, mm -hmm. um, and you know, like. 
she runs physics camps for physics teachers, where the physics teacher come in and work with her. So that might be, like I said, another resource. Yeah, another contact. Mm -hmm. the, the more contacts we have, the better. <laughs> and especially if she's local. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's nice. It's nice. Like we talked earlier in, at one of our meetings, it's nice when we have people come here. You know, so I'll that we can interact. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. Did you guys have any questions for me? Yeah, no, not to be redundant, and maybe we can just report out during the first day of report in the board meeting about the community learning loss meeting today. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have um, something that I'll get with you separately. Okay. I'm not prepared to talk about it at last year, but. Uh, <coughs> The same vein of promoting STEM mm -hmm. and uh, different and alternative ways to introduce kids to STEM. There's a, an AOPA, you know, Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, a curriculum okay. that is math and science with a, an aviation focus. Oh. Um, it's a pretty well developed curriculum. Uh, it's all free and available. Okay. Um, I have a bunch of detail on it. I think Tony knows some of it already. Yeah, and actually, um, just to kind of Piggyback on that, the, the AOPA or anything, it's a free aviation curriculum, like Josh said. Um, I actually have access to it now. As long as the school is willing to commit to awarding credit for the course as like high school credit, then they're. What would it count as, like an elective? It would count as like a, a math or something. Okay. You should okay. be embedded within that. Okay. Um, some of the schools that I've worked with, I mean, it's been in the area for probably about maybe a year or so now. Okay. A lot of the schools have not, you know, kind of gotten right into it because they're just afraid that they're not going to have enough people to fully implement it in their respective district. Uh -huh. So one of the projects that I'm working on um, is just trying to come up with sort of like a consortium arrangement where like if someone finally wanted in on it, you know, two people can come together, central, a couple people. Okay. Um, but as far as like the region goes, um, the gentleman who runs it said we're pretty much in the best place you can be because we have two airports right in our backyard. Okay. Both airports have reached out to me and they're ready to rock and get oh. things up and running. Okay. And there's actually a gentleman who um, is in a position at Geisinger, but he's a member of AOPA, AOPA <laughs> and has a 503C, whatever the last letter is, um, and purchased flight simulators and things like that that he said that he would be happy to let us use. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I got that. Yeah, I, I got to demo the Flight simulator. It's a it's an eighty thousand dollars full motion mm -hmm. flight simulator at San Francisco Airport, which would be free wow. for the students. Yeah, it would be super cool. <laughs> but the thing with it is, and if you'd be interested, I mean, I'd be happy to kind of set some okay. things up. But it's a nine through twelve curriculum. Okay. Um, the thing about it is, it is flexible. Like it doesn't have to run nine through twelve. Like if you only want to do it ten, and it just depends on your pacing. Okay. But out of that particular program. You can come out, and I'm not a pilot, so I don't know, you know, there's an app. Right. You can come out prepared to take your pilot's test and even log some hours within the flight simulator. Oh, wow. But the thing that I was most interested, at least at the IU, for was that commercial drone pilot's license, which um, that's one of the other tracks that's part of the program that you can get, they said, um, in 11th grade. Okay. So, yeah, so the, the idea would be you, you could just do this to learn math and science right. and, and or you and could actually come out with <laughs> or you could choose one of these specialization tracks right. later in, in the program. program if you come out with a private pilot license you could come out with a drone operator license um it also there's a, a path to prep you for aviation mechanics so like that oh, wow. um, and then there's all the other careers that are in this area like right air traffic control and, and there's there's lots of different tangential careers that right. this may open up thoughts about that Yeah, that, that sounds great. That wouldn't have otherwise thought of. All right. And, and, and we've been interested in it because, you know, we do a lot of grant work with things and mm -hmm. some career pathways grants and it actually kind of goes with the career pathways grant as well as the grant. Okay. has got a big STEM grant too. Um, but the other thing, part of the career pathways grant and the STEM ecosystem grant involves working with local community colleges. So we have a relationship with um, Luzerne County Community College, their Greater Susquehanna Valley campus. Okay. So like, I'm kind of trying to 
push some of the connection off on one of our people who are handling that and also possibly having it run through LCC to have some college credit awarded. Oh, right. That would be great. But yeah, we're, we're kind of at a standstill with it because we have a roadblock where people didn't want to allow the area school district students to leave the school during the day to take the coursework. It wasn't like accounting for college credit for some reason. Right, right. It's kind of a barrier that we have right now. But yeah, um, okay. it's definitely there and available. Right, I would like us to, to look at it as part of the test. Okay. Can we do the school that offered with it? Nobody else is. Yeah. That would be, yeah. That would be fabulous. All right. Well, maybe. Can you send me what you have? Or anything yeah, I, you have? And then we can, maybe we can kind of set up a meeting. What I'll do is because I have like this committee that's on it, kind of, I'll get, I'll put Colleen and our new consultants and help me with it. Okay. I'll put you guys in. We can at least do it here. I think that's the easiest thing to do is to just get it up and running right. through the school and like right. spread it. But I'll connect um, all of us. Okay. All right. That'd be wonderful. Sounds good. <laughs> We're very anxious to get it up and running. Well, I could imagine. Yeah. And I think it's a great opportunity for our kids. I mean, like you said, especially with the airport, the Bloomsburg one is right here. Well, not right here, but pretty much right here. <laughs> yeah. I talked to Vic today. Oh, did you tell him? He very much wants to know what it was going to be about because it was special. <laughs> well, there you go. Did you tell him that I was on the <laughs> <laughs> My role overlaps mm -hmm. a lot of <laughs> No, that's great. Okay. All right, anything else? Brian, do you have anything? No, not at this time, Mrs. Zygmunt. Um, I, I will, in upcoming meetings, I'm, I'm probably going to hit the board with uh, some, some stuff, uh, but not at this time. Okay. Are there any comments? There are no comments. So, eat your <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Davis, are you going to pause us? Do, do you guys, that's for my next question. Do you want me to pause? Is that what you'd like? Yes, yes. Yeah. Pause. Yep, I'll let you know when we're off air then. Just give me a few seconds.
Mr. Vote, we are now live on YouTube. Brian? Brian? Yes, we're now live, guys. How did they log on to these laptops? The email log. Email log. Yeah. SASD. Thank you, Mr. Yamza. I need technical support over here. That we're good. <laughs> All right. Good evening, everybody. We'll call the meeting to order. We start with pledge of allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good roll call, please. Cindy Brassington. Present. Drew Hampton. Here. Josh Hoagland. Here. Greg Clevelon. Brianna Majeski. Present. Josh Majeski. Here. Tony Serafini. Here. Tim Bowen. Here. Eli Yemzel. Present. Eight members present. All right, we'll move on to, uh, we'll skip the agenda hearing period and come back to that before we're ready to vote. Mr. Becker, it's all you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vote. Uh, tonight we have a couple guests with us, uh, Mr. Ken Kreider and Mr. Tony Lilo from Columbia Montorbo Tech. They give us a presentation on their renovation project that they're having up at, that they're planning on having up at the Columbia Montorbo Tech. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Kreider. All right, thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much for uh, having us here this evening. Uh, my first time on Southern campus, and I, I did a quick little walk, and uh, very nice. So thank you again for having us down. Um, pretty short presentation here tonight. We'll talk a little bit about uh, where our project is, the proposal, where we're at, where we came from, and how we got to uh, uh, be to this point right now. So click. Okay, I'll, I'll review a little bit of the project history. We'll talk about the enrollment history. We'll talk about a proposed facility. We'll look at a design proposal. And then we'll talk about a maximum cost that the project could uh, run into. Click. I like how this works. Um, the CMABTS building proposal, it's been going on for several years now, but long before I was employed there. Um, we did start to work with a company called Alloy 5. Uh, they were hired back in 2018 to be the architectural firm. In 2018-19, Alloy conducted a feasibility study for the ABTS to come up with some different design concepts during that period of time. There was a project design that uh, individuals liked. They felt it would meet the needs of the area. And that was presented back in 2019-2020, and it was a $27 million project. It was a hybrid option, but at the time the JOC did not take any action on that current project. We all know what happened very shortly after we entered this pandemic uh, of COVID, and lots of things changed on us very rapidly and very quick in the world of education. In 2020-2021, uh, um, I was hired as a new administrator to come on board, and I immediately started working with Alloy 5 and the superintendents uh, of our sending schools, along with the JOC and the community at whole, and we took a look at another design and another project as to where we were at. On March 16th of 2021, at the JOC meeting, a project design was proposed and presented by Alloy 5. And the JOC members, the steering committee members, and the other individuals really liked that whole concept and idea as to where we were going. So on April 20th, 2021, the JOC officially voted to approve the facility upgrade to CMABTS as it was presented that day by Alloy 5 at a maximum cost of $16,820,885. 
Click. When we take a look at some of the CMABTS history, this was one of the areas that I was really asked to, to take a deep dive into, and it was PIM systems, which is our reporting system for our numbers and information. And I took a look at grades 9 through 12 on that enrollment. The website is there that I pulled the information on, public school enrollment report at pa.gov. And what I found was some pretty interesting information. Since 2014-15, statewide CTE enrollments have increased by a rate of 3.4% from 65,885 to 68,105 in 1920, 2019-20. While nine through 12th grade enrollment have dropped 1.1% from 546,960 to 540,854 statewide. When we took a look at the 2019-20 statewide enrollment in CTE programs, career and technology education programs, I found out that it was very close to around 12% of the 9th through 12th grade population was attending CTE. What I found in Columbia and Montour County was that same enrollment is right around 20% of the student population is interested in taking CTE classes, 640, 3,191 students. And again, we're just looking at nine through 12. And the attendance at CMABTS only, not looking at all of the other career and tech ed programs throughout our county. The other thing I wanted to compare is the history of the enrollment at CMABTS. Where has that been? Is it declining? Is it increasing? Has it just been steady? Well, what I found out was the average over a 10 year period is 633. Our building capacity is 680. And it's an average operating capacity of 93%. So we're doing pretty good. We're utilizing our building, we're keeping it cool, we're keeping the students there. And one of the things that we had talked about was when you look at the projections for enrollment, the projections for enrollment is showing throughout the state that there is a declining enrollment projected 10 plus years out, five years out, somewhere around in there. Where those numbers actually come from are based off of the birth rates in those areas so they can project these numbers based off of the number of births, the kids that will attend kindergarten, and how that's disseminated on up through the different grade levels. When it comes to career and technology education, this is a very hard number to try to project because we're an elective. So you need to be able to get into the minds of the child when they start to pick classes in eighth, ninth, 10th grade, depending on the career programs that they're looking at, and that data just is not available to be able to go out and do those projections. So what we have to look at is historical data, and then we have to look at the labor data that comes with the business and industry sector and the demands for employment for the different courses that are out there. Click. So when we took a look at the facility renovation, again, we started out with that $27 million project and we were able to work this down to a $16.8 million project. And here's the reason why. What we're going to do is we are only going to address our building's infrastructure. The needs that will uh, need to be fixed to be able to bring our building into ADA compliance. We have 13.1 million of the project that will address these infrastructure issues and will also help to make our building more handicapped accessible. This would be the second major building renovation project that CMABTS has had in its 53 years. The first building project, the design was in 2001. 
When CMABTS was built, the CTE program shared a theory room space. Over the years, the need for additional theory room space has become apparent. Over the years, in order for each program to have dedicated theory rooms, programs utilize mezzanine space as instructional labs, while other programs utilize storage rooms for theory rooms, and some have built theory rooms that are in the lab area. Today, CT programs of study demand a more in-depth understanding of the concepts and the needs of adequate space for both theory and lab. And that will help us to be compliant with today's standards. We are looking at a very small addition of about 8,000 square feet that will help us to be able to correct these issues in the CTE program area. Okay? Click. And I don't know if you can click on the Adobe or if you'll have to go open the second document I asked you to pull up. Either way will work fine. <clears throat> You probably have to get out of presenter. Reduce screen share. Oh, he's pulling that up. Can you tell us all what the difference between theory room and lab room? The theory room and the lab room, okay, a separate area to where our students will be uh, able to use uh, the whiteboards, theory rooms, the instructor will be able to present the content that would go with any type of a program in a theory environment. The lab area then would be considered as the construction area or the, uh, in some of our shops, it's a dirty area. And in some of the shops, some of our programs like our health programs, the theory room is really actually just part of that lab area as well. Separate desk tables and things along that line. But in some of the, uh, like the automotive shop, the auto body shop, the welding shop, uh, carpentry, building trades, where you're gonna have a lot of sawdust flying and machines running, you wanna have a place where the instructor and everybody can also be heard. All that dust and dirt is an inside that classroom. Yeah, and to kind of add to that, I mean, basic, it's just like a classroom. And mm -hmm. I mean, theory you'll, classroom. You'll kind of see in some of the class, or the, some of the rooms, there's a theory room that's was post talk built into the room. Yes. Like, I mean, there is essentially like a shed <laughs> inside this room that is where the students will go in. And, and it's, I mean, that's how it is. So I think the idea behind this is to create a real space and especially given COVID I mean you have these kids crammed in I, I I can't even believe it how they all get in there and actually you know I mean they're like almost on top of each other given yeah. the space. If you get an opportunity it is a great tour and sure Ken would walk you through but it is a great tour to see what it's like right now and compare sure. yeah. what, what it yeah. really has to be. It's an impressive use of the space at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm just simply amazed when, you know, they, they told me how cramped and crowded they were. I said, ah, I'll come in here, I'll show you where some extra space is. I showed them how to get a conference room or a training center. Other than that, they are utilizing every inch of that school and then some uh, for what they have. And uh, COVID has not been our friend with social distancing and things along that line. We've had to come up with a very unique schedule. But it's worked, and we've gotten through the year, and our students, in spite of the things we may talk about, um, they are earning industry certifications, they are getting a wonderful education, and they are being very productive as they graduate and move on. So the space is not hampering uh, their abilities to learn and move forward, but uh, I do believe there's a lot more we could accomplish if we had a little more room to spread out and spread our wings. So if you take a look, and it might be easier for me to just come up here and point so I can explain this part. I'll just slide here, thank you. Kind of a little hard to see things on this drawing, but 
when we talk about a, a, a shared theory room, so if you take a look at the machining shop up here, if you take a look at the carpentry shop here, this would have been the shared theory room, a door here, a door here, okay? Today you'll find that this is the theory room for machining. And inside the carpentry room is a, a room, like a shed, it's not a shed, but it is, I guess it probably is, that the carpentry students built that is able to accommodate that theory room. You have the same thing in all of these different areas for the different programs, and over here in auto, they've done the exact same thing. Some of those rooms that they utilize are actually, they were originally storage rooms, and we've converted them and turned them into classrooms. So this is why we're looking at this small addition so we can correct this and give adequate space for those theory rooms. If you take a look, here's the original building, here's where we're at, capacity 380 students, and uh, our current layout. Move that down to the next one. Oh, the, the capacity. You gotta scroll this one. Okay, you said 380, capacity 600. 680, I'm sorry, thank you, Mr. Lilo. This is why we bring the business manager who's really good with numbers, he keeps me on track. This is what we're looking at for the proposal and the changes, okay? We're looking at taking the machine shop, keeping it work right where it's at, a little expansion there, possibly a classroom in between the machine shop and the carpentry program. I, I think when it's all said and done, that classroom will make more sense to be down here with the other academics. Giving the carpentry a little bit more room and then taking the building trades program and giving that a little bit more room and expansion as well. The auto tech program is currently located right here but it makes much more sense to move it down here where the agricultural program is, move HVAC over to where the auto program is, and keep auto body right where it's at. By doing this move, I can then put a very small addition out here of about 1,500 square feet off of our welding program. This is our welding program right here. And then that will give us a fabrication and assembly area. Right now, some of those students, when weather's permitting, they will go out and they work right outside the shop, but this is actually a garage bay here as well that goes into our automotive program. So we have to make sure that we are, are very careful with what we're doing, keep an eye on, but this will uh, provide them with a nice assembly area, the instructor will be able to keep track of everything. That'll take care of this half of the building. One of the things the architect looked at when he did some of the moving is we have no common planning areas in our building. Places where our students can come together, a couple different classrooms can come together at the same time, groups, clubs, organizations that you need to have. So he looked at putting in a common learning area here to where our students can uh, enjoy that as well. Down here, we have two medical programs. We have health profession and health sciences and we were looking at grouping the two of them together. Currently, they're on opposite sides of the building. By grouping them together, it's very possible they could share the same lab space, utilize some of the same equipment, and then we won't have to duplicate some of our items. We did look at moving cosmetology out here, but because we've had to cut some money off of the project already, I do believe cosmetology is going to end up staying right where it's at because State Board of Cosmetology regulates everything that goes into a cosmetology program. Size of restrooms, size of the uh, opening area, the way, uh, entry to where they come in, the size of the theory room, they have to have a dispensary for their materials and things, all regulated square footages by State Board. We're already meeting all that. So I think it would be just an extra expense. What we are looking for though, is we need to move our agricultural or horticulture program. And the idea was to put it next to our science rooms so that we could share the biology and the science along with the ag and, and the hort and put all of that stuff together. So I think what we'll do is look at putting that right here and then maybe turn this into our student services area, special education and some other offices because office space is much cheaper to build than some of the other spaces that we would have. Again, the design is just in a thought process. I refer to it as the napkin design because we're going to have to do it in reverse design. This is all the money we have to spend. 
that's what we need to work with. And then we'll end up, number one, taking care of all of our infrastructure needs for our students in our buildings to bring it up to ADA compliant. And then we'll be able to take care of things from there. Again, a little like $8,000 or 8,000 square foot addition, uh, 800 possibly to some uh, academic rooms. But the key here is it's just bringing the building back into check. We are not adding any additional square footage for students or student enrollment population to come into our school. So that's a key to look at as we look at that. Anybody have any questions on this? Uh, you can do one more slide up if you want. Again, the original total for everything we had looked at on the March 16th board meeting was 17,988,000. After our board meeting, what the JOC ended up deciding on is all we can spend is 16,800,000 uh, and some change. So we have to whittle a little bit off there and get it down and we, our architect assures us that we'll be able to do that and still come up with a very good quality product. Uh, what we need to meet the needs of our students. Okay, Does anybody have any questions on that before I go back to the other part of the presentation? I think we're good. Okay. Now where do you want to go? Back to the original PowerPoint. And you're down probably about four slides. There's only a couple more to go, guys. We'll get through this here pretty quick. <clears throat> ah, perfect. Another one, another one, another one. Okay, so again, the maximum project cost, $16,820,885. When we take a look at the bulk of where all this money is going to come from, you're going to be looking at an infrastructure cost of $13,095,000. It's going to take care of the site issues, the paving, general structure, roofing, the mechanical systems, HVAC systems, plumbing, and electrical. And that's going to be the bulk of where we're coming to. So. Anything that we have to whittle from is gonna come from all those other areas. This is what we, we really have to make sure we concentrate on and take care of as well. You have another click. There you go. Any questions from anybody on what, what we've presented or about the project? Yeah, could you talk a little bit? Um, I've been pretty, we've been pretty clear about not going <clears throat> anything over the 16.8. <laughs> Um, and that's kind of the number that we have in mind, but uh, could you talk a little bit more yes. about some of yes. the, um, the mm -hmm. uh, Grand grants and everything that you are pursuing that while we're not necessarily considering that as a discount, but it's something that could end up reducing the total cost in the Possibly where we're at. But I'll tell you, um, keep in mind, uh, our board, uh, we, we refer to as a JOC, a Joint Operating Committee, and the reason for that is, is it's comprised of members of your board and every one of our sponsoring districts. So your members also are taking the interests of your school and coming and presenting at the same time they're taking interests of our school. So we have to make sure we do our due diligence when it comes financially to what it is that we do. The ABTS has no ability to raise taxes, revenues, or anything like that. All of our money comes from your board and then some grants and some other outside uh, monies that we can raise uh, to take care of our bills and fees. The board was very adamant about holding to 16.8 million for the cost of this project so much that in the motion that they made, they included the word not to exceed a maximum of. So we have to hold to that. Uh, we can't go over that when it comes to without coming back to you guys uh, and to be able to ask for you know anything that would be more as far as that goes. We are pursuing all kinds of grants. This has been a banner year for grants and to be able to write grants and we've had more opportunities for money than I've ever thought would ever come our way. Some of it was state money due to some COVID issues 
uh, things along that line, but a lot of it were just uh, people, uh, faculty, staff, individual companies, corporations, picking up the phone and calling and asking if the ABTS would be interested in applying. Uh, to date, we have about $1,400,000 of grants that uh, we have written and uh, we're work looking to receive most of those. Uh, there's a couple of them that are still outstanding. Um, but we will pursue every avenue we can. In some of these areas, as we pursue our project, the architect tells us that there are grants available once our project is approved and it is on the way and we can apply for them. And what the JOC has asked is that that grant money come off of the top of the cost of the project so that those reductions would come back to our districts and save you money as to where it would be for the final end in the project. There's a couple of theories out there as to what we should do, uh, not just release that money back right away, but because the project has a time frame to take us out to 2023, uh, what if we would run into an issue when they dig in the soil and we would have something that we would have an unexpected expense that we would have to come up with, or maybe they'll be working in an area that we don't have any clue and maybe they would come up with an asbestos issue. So uh, a couple of the boards have asked, just hold on to that money. And then at the end, we'll talk about what to do with it and where to go. Uh, but we'll be open, again, uh, our, our JOC members will decide how we go about doing that in the end. But that's what they want us to do as we continue. And uh, we'll continue to pursue grant monies as it goes and anything that we can find that will help alleviate the cost of the building, uh, we're still going to pursue them and go with them. Ken, can you talk about the, the funding and the timing of the funding? I'm going to let Mr. Lilo talk about that. I have to give him a part. So, so the funding, as you know, your portion, based on the articles of agreement and the formula within those articles of agreement, your portion of the total cost of the project is based on market values. Uh, the market values as provided by the Pennsylvania State Equalization Board each year. Mm -hmm. um, so right now, that's 11.89% of the total, and that's where we're, we're getting your $2 million, okay? Um, as far as when we would need to have the $2 million uh, in the possession of the CMABTS authority in order to, to pay bills, uh, we'd need 10%, um, probably within the next couple of months here, assuming we get going based on the timeline the architect has provided. Uh, that's, that's if all of the, the districts vote on this and approve it and we could get started in July, uh, we would need 10% at that point in time. Um, then moving forward, we would need the remainder, the, remainder, the remaining 90% upon uh, the bids being awarded. Mm -hmm. When the bids are awarded, then we'll need to have that money available in order to pay uh, bills that come due at that point in time. And that's where Ken's saying, if we, if we do end up saving money, or having grants that, that possibly contribute to this, then we look at how to redistribute that money back to the district. I shouldn't say how, it would be distributed back based same on the form. same formula, but when and how we would do that. Does that clear that up as to how that would? And that I confirmed, uh, there were some questions previously about why, do, why would we need a 90%? Um, and probably, February or March of, of 2022, and the architect uh, and I checked with our solicitor both said you would need to have the funds in the possession of the CMABTS when you're awarding those bids. So, what type of contingency was built into that um, estimate for increased materials costs and unexpected things? There that was. Is there, is there, there is some. It's not an overabundance. It's not, it's not an overabundance. And as we take a look at what ended up happening uh, with COVID and some of our prices and building materials, it could affect some of the things that we, we are looking at possibly doing. Uh, but again, we're going to put our main emphasis and concentration on that infrastructure area. Um, so we may have to look at some other areas. That, that common area I showed, that may end up disappearing and becoming a classroom. Uh, we have to start dipping into things like that. Okay, so what we're not going to do is we're not going to say, oh, now this project's running over what we expected. We're going to need more money from you. Mm -hmm. That's not, 
we're going to we're going to do what Ken said. We're going to look at what can we do to now reduce other right. costs. In the 17 uh, million, almost 18 million, he had 500,000 in contingencies. Okay, but again, remember we had to take 1.1 million out of that. So, given the elevated prices right now for materials mm -hmm. and the possibility of all kinds of federal money raining down on us in the next coming years from whatever it may be. Yeah. <clears throat> Does it make sense to drag our feet on this, or do we need to move forward now? Can you explain to the board and the public yes or no and why? Well, you want, yeah. you want to answer that? You want yeah, I, I really think that uh, it makes sense to move forward with what we're looking at. It, it would not make sense to move forward with the $28 million because we don't know what the future has to, to hold. No matter what we decide to do in the future with the building, regardless, we have to take care of our roof structure. We have to take care of the infrastructure. We need to bring everything up to ADA compliant with what, what we are doing and the things we're taking care of, the mechanicals of the building. Um, I look at it this way when I talk to my maintenance manager. It's very simple. He says, it's like driving that old car. It's gonna get you from point A to point B, but again, you're gonna stop and you're gonna make a lot of repairs and you're gonna repair the same thing over and over again as to what it is you need to do. So he refers to it as that nickel and dime in you to where you're at with the things we're doing. Uh, a, a good example, our control systems for our HVAC, uh, they were on the verge, they went out on us right before winter, uh, just as we started to fire up and use things. And uh, he picked the phone up and he called me and he said, we're gonna do everything we can do but the company that takes care of our controls told me that we have the oldest control system of anybody that they deal with. The, nobody else has it. Our building right now is currently, well, not right now. Prior to this, it was running off of software from a school out in Pittsburgh that they were able to patch it together to be able to get us through uh, the main part of the winter. I told him we cannot function like that. If we would have lost those controls, if they would have went down completely, we're looking at a minimum of three to four weeks that our building would have been shut down, or we would have had to come up with some fancy way to run it. I said, that's not acceptable. So we pulled together and we ended up putting a new control system in and took care of that expenditures right now, which again was part of the renovation. Uh, they've kicked the can down the road way too far uh, with looking at building remodeling, building renovation, and the problem became that old cliche. We'll wait and take care of that when we get the building renovation project. We don't want to put this kind of money or into anything because we're gonna get this building renovation project that's right around the corner. And nobody could have predicted that, uh, that things that would have happened in the process of getting that. So. That's you know where I sat down with the architect and the maintenance uh, supervisor um, and the JOC and the steering committee, uh, the superintendents. We picked the areas of the ABTS that we feel are, we've got to take care of these now. These are the things that we need to take care of. I think to Josh's point too, um, I think it's important to note that I, I, you know, this is definitely a temporary squeeze in this with these prices that are coming through because of COVID, but also, I mean, we have to look at the broader implications of, there's $6 trillion being proposed at the federal level um, that is going to increase inflation for sure. Um, so the inflation rate will very likely um, increase over the next couple of years that may have broader implications for, for um, costs aside from just even materials. And that's just, that's assuming that materials were to decrease. So I think getting this done sooner than later is going to be better in the long run because i mean i think just i mean we don't even know the effects of the previous you know two years mm -hmm. of money that's been just pumped into our supply so and i don't know how, how southern columbia is planning on financing but if you're planning on borrowing money obviously this is a, a good time with the rates money. sure mm -hmm. so josh just heard the check <laughs> in the mail? So, where where is the threshold for where you would say we have to wait? If we if you go to 
to proceed. Say we everybody approves it and we start down this path and we get to the point where we're buying materials and we're looking at 60%, 70% increase in materials because right. that's a very real possibility sure. for a short period of time. Right, right. It, where is your threshold for, hey, this makes sense to wait six months? Well, that's, that's my, I guess, my better question. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that, that's an interesting question and I think what we're going to have to do is uh, we take a look at where everything's going to come in at and at the time when we go to go out for bid. Uh, again, I'll go back to the infrastructure part of our building is by far the most important thing that we would have to take care of. We're looking at 13.1 as to where that would be, which is only leaving you with, with a little bit left, uh, 3.7 uh, million for the other parts. So if we were to exceed or come close, if that 13, let's just roll a hypothetical, that 13.1 rolls into 16, then at that point, that's when you start to say if it goes over that and you can't do all of the things you're looking at, is there a way to prioritize it? Because keep in mind, okay, if we would have done this 10 years ago, when the original proposal, seven, eight years ago, when the original proposal was out there, you probably would have ended up with the equivalent of the 20 plus million dollar renovation versus where all those prices are right now. So every time we kick the can down the road, we're gambling on is the price actually going to come back down and be better or is it going to go up and stay? So you're saying basically that if the infrastructure plans uh, come back at higher than the 16.8 million, we have to look potentially putting it off. Well, again, I can't make that decision. I understand. I, I, that would be a JOC as, as to where we're at, but I would say that would be that would be something that would throw a flag up to us that would say we need to have that conversation. Yeah. I mean, if, if the 13 million infrastructure project Balloons by like sixty percent. Right. Like what portion of that is materials and what is labor and what's actually affected there is correct. There's no way to know. That there's no right. way to know. But say that say that balloons sixty yeah. percent. That's a, that's almost eight million dollars in itself, right? Right. So that alone, you don't even get your infrastructure project. Right. Right. So right. right. That's what we certainly have to consider. It's really, I, I guess, you guys should probably be, if you're not already, prioritizing things in the And we are. We are. And we've challenged our architect to do that as well. Um, it, it's, it, it is tricky, and uh, to be able to go into a project like this, uh, to have a maximum amount not to exceed, it is going to be very tricky uh, waters for us to navigate, but uh, I do feel that uh, being in the building now for a full year, looking at the things that we have, it, it is definitely needed. It, it truly is. Yeah, I, I, don't get me wrong, I agree completely, mm -hmm. I'm a strong right. supporter of everything that you do. And and the need for this project, maybe not uh, an expansive mm -hmm. correct $30 million project, but the infrastructure upgrade and a minimal additional mm -hmm. space, I, I'm a strong supporter of that. I just worry about the timing yes. and what you're going to end up, what do you end up with at the end of this project if you have to drive right. away for just getting... And, and these the are things we have been discussing with the architect. Um, no, we brought it up. Yeah, he's aware that we have concerns about that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think, as Mr. Kreider stated, you get to a certain point that you can't do the infrastructure within that 16 million, then you really have to reconsider the timing of it. Okay. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kreider, too, this is kind of unrelated to the building project. Could you talk a little bit about the proposed? Um, uh, change to the um, agreement with the uh, CMABTS. I was going to bring it up maybe in the uh, my committee report of it, but I figure it might be a little bit easier if you just discuss it and can answer any questions. Okay, very um, good. That the board might have. Well, we talked about enrollments, uh, and that one of the reasons I included the enrollment slide in the presentation is again throughout our county, and uh, we're taking a look at that projection of declining enrollments, and there's been a lot of concern of will our numbers stay where they're at, will your numbers stay where they're at, where will we be at student population wise. And recently, uh, the very same night that I was voted in, that was the night that 
uh, they took the vote for Benton to leave our consortium, which took us from seven districts down to six. There was some talk about the possibility of should we have readjusted the numbers within our school to be able to accommodate for the loss of the Benton population. Uh, we work off of what is called a enrollment quota system. So it's a ninth grade quota. It doesn't mean you multiply it by four and that's the number of students you pay for. You pay for a four year rolling average of the number of students that uh, are in the school that your school would send with a whole bunch of other formulas and calculations involved there too. Okay, so the, the comments came out from a superintendent's meeting that the superintendents wanted me to look at a way to come up with either reducing the total number of students that they were sending in that quota or do we in turn look at uh, coming up with a way for tuition paying students to be able to come into the system at the same time that regular uh, sponsoring districts, consortium districts are coming in as well. So what we looked at was the possibility of adding six tuition paying positions. So that would be students from anywhere. Any student who is not a member of the consortium district would then be able to attend our school and get first round pick at classes on the enrollment process the exact same way that our consortium students would get their picks for students. Up front, it looked like a really good idea. Everybody liked it. We all went through, did the numbers. Here's where we're at. Because what would end up happening if those six students didn't apply, then we have a, a, a wait list every year that students go on to a wait list and they get second round over the summer that any positions that are open, you automatically pull off of that wait list and those students would get in. So my fear wasn't that there would be open slots. Um, it was how we were going to keep the numbers down for some of our sending districts that were concerned about the maximum number of students that they were sending us. I presented this at the board meeting and it was the, uh, it was a very long discussion as to where we were. And some interesting points came up from that um, that I never even considered, and I don't think our superintendents did either when we had the superintendents meeting. So the other thing that was included in that was a section that if our enrollment was to drop, so over a three year period of time, if that 633, 650 number was to start to decline, then we would have to start taking a look at how those numbers are affecting our programs and then would we also have to start looking at reductions within what we're doing as well the same way that your schools look at it when you have declining enrollment and things along that line so that's what that was uh, we were asked to table that motion and uh, bring it to the boards to let you guys talk about your options with that and how you felt about that and where to go with it and uh, I'm not sure if it'll make the, our, it's not on the agenda right now, I don't think, sure. but it may be on for June, depending on how you guys decide as to where to go. Yeah, and to talk a little bit more, at least with some of my concerns um, involving it was, I mean, the way I kind of saw it is if there is demand within our districts, at our individual home districts to send students to um, Columbia Montorvo Tech, I don't see the need in artificially reducing that capacity just because our attendance is dropping, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of my concern because, you know, if we kind of forcefully gut the CMVTS, then, you know, that's, we're, we're all weaker by it. And, um, you know, a lot of it is just the students in mind is if we have students here who want to go, um, that's why we, that's why we pay for this building. That's why we are supporters of the Votech because, um, because we have students in our area because there's a need for it. So um, the way I kind of saw this proposed proposal here was just a, um, a way of kind of, again, artificially reducing numbers just because some of our home districts didn't like the idea of more students leaving. So there was that aspect of it. Um, I think the clause too with like the, you know, in, the drop by 5%, um, I don't see that as unnecessary. I think that, you know, the administration should constantly be evaluating programs, constantly be evaluating the needs 
um, regardless of whether there's a drop. I mean, obviously you guys have the industry leaders that can kind of talk to you and tell you whether or not uh, there's a need for a certain programs. And my hope is that that is done on a continual basis. So um, that was kind of my biggest concern with it. And then there was also just concerns with, um, you know, we make these six open slots and we do have students from our district say who, you know, we have extra students who want to go. We're prioritizing students outside of the consortium to um, in instead of our own students. So it's like, you know, I'm sure we, there might be a cost savings in terms of, you know, charging tuition for these other students. But, um, you know, like I said, we pay for this, we pay for this uh, building, we pay for the school. So um, I really think that, at least from for my end, and of course you guys can feel free to chime in, um, it just kind of seemed uh, unnecessary. If things change, if there is a drastic reduction or you know something like that comes up, I think it's definitely something that could be explored, but I just don't see the need for it at the time. Uh, Mr. Cryer showed the numbers over the past several years. It, it hasn't decreased too much in the past. It doesn't look like that is decreasing much. We've talked with the um, director of uh, uh, with uh, getting the students in, and there's been a Student services. services. Yeah, there's been a, um, a good amount of students even this year, given the pandemic, who have applied to be uh, part of the school, which was I think awesome work by the low tech. To uh, they normally have a huge open house that they get uh, the word out to get students in, and they haven't been able to do that. But regardless, they kept their numbers pretty consistent, all things um, mm -hmm. considered. So. Uh, I had sent them th this to the board and I just figured it'd be good to bring it up now because um, we got tabled it at the meeting because the JOC was unsure where to go with it, but we figured we'd bring it here and get some input. Do, do we have students on the waitlist now? I'm not sure if <clears throat> we have any students on the waitlist. For this coming, or this, this year, right now, we didn't have any on the waitlist. You didn't have, I don't have the breakdown of each individual district that had the waitlist. But when I came on board, we had 100 students on the wait list, and that was less Benton. All of our slots were filled, and the 11 slots that were available for Benton students were already taken, and there were uh, a little over 100 students on the wait list, uh, the highest we ever had. Uh, this year, again, a COVID situation, we weren't able to get out and have our open houses um, but uh, I'm told there will be a small wait list generated. Uh, all of our slots will be filled and there'll be a small wait list and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. But, and again, that's not opening up any tuition paying slots um, to go Mr. from there. Mr. So, Dr. Berger uh, stated that we've exhausted the wait list for this year mm -hmm. um, as of right now right. for the ninth grade class. How, how does that the biggest the biggest thing with that is, is what they were suggesting with this is that we wouldn't be able to offer an outside of the JOC student that was interested until now right to start in ninth grade <clears throat> well, what do you have three weeks left we offered probably back you know, in uh, the, the end of March the beginning of April to tuition paying students we had a handful of slots and we offered them to come in at that point, okay? Um, which again, you know, what we looked at was you know being able to offer that at the beginning of the year. But uh, after listening to the JOC members and you know their comments that went with that, um, they're one hundred percent correct. Uh, you are the the districts that are the member consortium districts. You are the ones that are supporting what's going on uh, at the ABTS, and it only makes sense that the supporting districts would have that role first um, and and that's just you know uh, I'll do whatever the JOC and uh, the supporting districts want us to do when it comes to that it's providing good quality career and technology education to the students of Columbia and Montour County uh, we certainly have tuition paying students in our county as well but uh, I think we also need to pay our due diligence to the schools that are supporting us and uh, picking up those those bills that we have as well. Aren't, aren't the sending districts required to provide the education if their students want it? So how so mm -hmm. for the hundred or so students around the waitlist, what is 
what happens with them. Do they, do they, they, they stay at their home school, but if they push it, we have to find a place. Right, so, so they, they shoot, yeah. so because there's no room at right, the Columbia Montour, they say, I, I'm going to stay at the at my sending district. But if they said, I still want this town, then that, that sending district has to provide it somehow, right? Find a spot. <laughs> has to find um, I know Columbia Montour has been very, very good with working with us to try to get kids in that really want right, to. Right, that makes sense. And, I mean, it this, and it deserves, because it, there's an application process. It's not. This, this is an important point, though, because we don't really have a choice. Well, if a student to. wants a certain path, we have to provide a means for them to get there. It's well, that's what we're looking at. Typically, cheapest for us to use mm -hmm. the the path that we already paid for, and it makes sense because transportation is set up and all these things. But from a conversation, like a year or two ago, we were discussing the possibility of switching to Montgomery County, right? And different program mix, right? Different offerings, different. Okay. And but problem, and if we are still required right. to provide this education and students right. ask for it and we don't have room wherever we're going, we're on the hook for the tuition payment somewhere else than as a non sending group. Mm -hmm. And that was discussed too, I think, at the last meeting in terms of like if we add these six tuition paying seats, um, we're reducing the number of students that, again, that we could send. Right. Um, so it's that was discussed too. And then, you know, then we're paying tuition somewhere else then. Um, when we essentially already pay for this. And then on one slide, Kim showed you, it showed Columbia Montour's enrollment. That really opened my eyes because I knew the enrollment across districts in our area are going down. Um, Columbia Montour's is not. So that's saying even though our numbers are going down, their numbers aren't. So um, it just, you know, it, it would, it would, I don't think it's a good thing to reach out to other schools or open it up unless Less, Columbia Montour's enrollment goes down, which right, yeah, you know, it, it hasn't. So, and and that's the other reason we looked at is we looked at the project that that hybrid model included a bunch of additions, expansions, extra programs being added, more students uh, taking our number up over 700, and now when you throw all this other stuff into the mix, let's just let everything settle out and see what happens after all this COVID stuff. But regardless of what we would ever do, the things we're doing to the building now have to be done. And then we can take a look at anything in the future that we would want as well. But we're going to have a good solid sound structure moving forward. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks, guys. Okay, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Yeah. You're going to pay. I'll never make a question. Thank you so much, everybody. Have yeah. yourself a great evening. If you have any other questions, feel free to email myself or Mr. Lilo, and we'll do what we can to answer them. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, just to go over a couple other things that I have. Under my report, um, the directors are asked to give uh, Teresa their uh, ballots for CSIU uh, by June 4th. If you can get them to her, CSIU ballots. Um, we have on the agenda tonight policy 810.3 bus idling to rescind this. Now, the 810 policy, which we just recently approved, has everything in there regarding. Uh, bus idling. So we're just going to rescind that. Now we do, we did talk in our policy meeting regarding the new 810.3. I have, I'm in conversation with our solicitor, so we're not ready to put that on the agenda yet, just to get a few more information uh, regarding that. Uh, school board treasurer, treasurer, excuse me, uh, there's a motion on the agenda tonight to appoint a school board treasurer. Currently, Mr. Claybon is the board treasurer. We can have that discussion when we we'll get to that action item. Board secretary, um, there's a motion on to approve the board secretary. Or well, somewhere along the line, we got off the cycle according to board our school code. It's every four years, and this is the year it should be done. So we're going to get back on the cycle with that. Um, Unless somebody else wants to. <laughs> what do you say? Very funny. Update on the masking. Um, 
we all know the CDC came out, and, and, and this has been one of the fun things of this year is how guidance changes at, you know, 4 o'clock on a Friday. And so this actually, the email from uh, Dr. Ortega, our Acting Secretary of Education, came out and, and, and basically is asking school districts to stay status quo with their mitigation efforts. So we have less than two weeks left of school. That's going to be our plan to stay because we don't know. Uh, we have a good idea of staff who was who vaccinated, but not we don't know 100 percent. We don't know and, and uh, the students who are we know some are getting vaccinated. We don't know who they are. Um, and again, with such short uh, time left in school, we've been doing such a good job. We are going to continue our mitigation efforts. A little disappointed, Jim. I thought you were going to tell us we could take our masks off. We were done. I would love to. Believe me. What, um, what does that look like for the summer? Or when well, we that's it? my next thing I want to bring up. I think what I'd like to do is come June 2nd when teachers are gone, kids are gone, I would like to follow CDC, follow DOH recommend guidelines. And if you are vaccinated, you don't need a mask inside, outside, that type of thing. Now, we have to be flexible, and some of the things we'll talk about is for next year. We've got to be flexible what guidance comes down from the state regarding our health and safety plan for next year and you know any kind of mitigation efforts the, the state wants us to have. Um, but I think once June 2nd rolls around, I think we, we have met many of our staff, not everybody, but many are vaccinated, and I feel that um, you know we can do follow mitigation. Or, you know, or it's, it's just our summer crew that are here, um, administration, <laughs> secretaries, and we can um, you know follow the CDC guidelines and take the mask off at that time. Let me ask you, what would be the thinking behind making somebody who chose not to get vaccinated continue to wear a mask? Um, good question, Josh. I'm not one that I have my own opinions what they would be. Um, I'm just trying to follow what the guidance is. So I, I, you know, I, I would love to get rid of these for everybody. That's my hope. I hope next year we start with, because I think wearing the mask held kids out of school, you know, to a point. But um, my thing is we're just going to follow what guidance has given us, you know. I've been fine with that generally this whole year, but their guidance sucks. Right. I had COVID two months ago. I have the antibodies the same as anybody who had the vaccine, probably better antibodies. As evidenced by people who got it last April and May, we don't hear tons of news stories about how they got it again. For some reason, our governor has kept them out of the 70% threshold to get them back. For some reason, the CDC has kept them out. So I would like to get it to the point where once everybody's been offered the vaccine, can get it, I think that's really the lead to turnover. Because at that point, anybody who chose to get it has had the opportunity, anybody who chose not to, that's their choice. Is that so, students as well? Yes. So all the way down to Canada? Yes. Okay. I agree with that. And I think that's something that I hope works its way out over the summer when we say unmasking following CDC guidelines on June 2nd. My immediate question is what does that mean for summer school kids? And are you going to make people prove that they're vaccinated? How is that going? How are we going to handle that? Those are things I'm hoping my solicitor in the state uh, clean up for us before August. Again, I don't have an issue with it either. That guidance was put out by the president. He said that they're not going to enforce it. So why, why would we? Why would you even ask? So I think employers have the right to request that. <laughs> and and schools do. And schools have the right to. Well, you require documentation for every other vaccine that's right. required. So what? What is? How is this any different? So yeah, I'm all about moving towards unmasking. I just want to make sure we're not doing the wrong thing when it comes to deciding who can unmask when and we're going to put ourselves in a precarious position. That's I'm hoping some more guidance comes down yeah. regarding the vaccinations. Like August, but everyone has had their chance, and that's exactly what it is. You're going to reach a point that's, where that's people have had an opportunity, and well, if you choose not to do it, okay, life is down the book. Once it's offered to everybody and available, and everybody's had an opportunity, if you choose not to get it, so then so be it. But one, until it's offered, you're still potentially putting someone at risk if the doesn't option. have the option then to get to that. Right. But that's that's what I see as a difference. 
Well, again, I think, you know, come June 2nd, we're going to follow the guidance from CDC. And then again, if you're vaccinated, um, take the mask on. But we know, like we know right now, anyone under 12 is in, can't get can't get a vaccine as of right now. By summer school, though, our middle school kids potentially could be fully vaccinated. You know, so that question yeah. is, how do we navigate who masks and who doesn't? And you have to prove it through there. You know, I'm not saying what's right or wrong. It's just right. we, we have some more balance yeah. before you want. Yeah. So there, there are definitely some issues that we're gonna discuss here and have to deal with in school. So we won't have to worry about that really until July, right? Yeah, yeah July 6th. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> and hopefully by then we'll have some more guidance come down. And like you said, they'll be uh, open up more. Have you, have you heard anything? anything right more? now they're saying they're looking at ages two and up in September, but my hope is, you know, they continue to roll things out quicker than they say. My hope is that by July they offer to that age group, so theoretically, elementary school students would have the opportunity to be fully vaccinated at the start of the school year if they so choose, but who knows. Okay. Um, we have a, uh, we're cre creating a new document <clears throat> on a website. We, uh, I was asked by the board to have uh, what we call a transparency document, and we have this right now that we started this, we kind of searched around, not to Teresa all the credit, she kind of searched around, found a great template for us to do. And what we like to do is put any kind of financial records or that type of thing on this document. And you can see, which, and this this isn't live by no means. We're just we've just put this, this just together. Started today. Yeah. So <laughs> and uh, work began today. <laughs> yeah. So, but has a great has a great. Uh, you know, feel to it, and you can look under it, and we can add things to it, and, and then, you know, and then keep things there throughout, you know, eternity. And I think it'd be a great tool. So, any feedback, what you think you may want on this website? Um, Teresa, I have, and I, I think I just saw that you're emailing me about that template. Mm -hmm. The template that I have is actually it's an Excel file, um, and it's. Based off what I, I got from another district, but it's it's housed in a program. I want to say it's called Smartsheets. Smartsheets basically takes um, a graph, you know, the spreadsheet and turns it into like a live um, graph. Okay. So it would probably require a subscription. I don't think the subscription. We, we all did have Smartsheets. Okay. I think it was Smartsheets that this was built in. But I do have the, the table that was actually in. Um, and I also reached out to the gentleman in Lancaster who set it up, and he said that he would be happy to connect on Zoom or something with us if he wanted to basically create okay. the same thing. Yeah, I can share that with you. Okay, yeah, I'll connect you with, with him and then we can get something set up. Okay. Who, who would we envision being responsible for maintaining this once it's set up? Regardless uh, of probably district office staff. Okay, and what would the frequency of update be expected to like well how current would you expect things to be? Uh, I would think when when a document is ready that's where it's up there. You know, when we when so like it gets emailed to the board and goes on on the website at the same time? You know, like the monthly invoices and stuff. I, sure. I'm good for that. I, sure. I'm just I'm asking the question. And then possibly put a link instead of whatever attaching a document, attach a link to it. So that affects how you structure this. You have to think through who who is going to be updating it and with what frequency are they going to be expected to maintain it. Because that very quickly affects, maybe it makes sense to buy a smart sheet subscription if that streamlines this approach or something like that. Like it just Actually, when we need smart sheets for other things, it seems to make more work for it. Does. So that's a, that's a great observation. Yeah. Like just think through that. Because if you're going to say that it's supposed to be up to date in near real time, I, mean, I for one am going to ask why it's not up to date in real time. Sure. So I understand. And I imagine there are several other people in the district. Here, if it's not, but it's also work to keep it up to date. So defining ownership is going to be important. Again, I think I like the start of it. Like, yeah, I think it's a great tool to, to get us started. Yeah. Adding some, some, you know, and then as we go, hey, this 
this would be a great place for this and you know, everything the co-op <laughs> Yeah, good, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, the well issue. Um, today we had a water problem in the high school, middle school building. Um, and I was notified about ten o'clock. Uh, Scott was notified probably nine forty-five somewhere in there. Um, we thought initially it was a a check valve type of issue um, because when they went down there the uh, pump wasn't running into the tanks. Um, they were looking at some things. I actually tapped on the one pump or check valve and the pumps jumped on started running. So we initially thought it would be an hour or so before the tanks would fill to a point where we were. By one o'clock we realized we had a little bit more of an issue because you can hear the water running into the tanks. Um, you think it's not running um, very strongly into the tanks. So we uh, called the, the Swank and Sons. They were here on campus this afternoon. Uh, they looked at a couple things. They had plans to pull that pump first thing tomorrow. Because of that, we had to um, go virtual, the high school, middle school building tomorrow. Now, a quick update. We got the water to a level where it was going to be able to be pumped out of the tanks. We, they went around, custodians were flushing toilets, that kind of stuff, because we had allow we allowed students after we realized we had the problem to start going to the elementary school to use the facilities, and some were going to the stadium using facilities. Um, again, we, short, we thought this was going to be a short-term problem. Uh, realized it's not. It's filling, but filling very slow. So we're hoping it's just a pump issue. So we'll know tomorrow morning when that pump gets pulled. Well, this is the first indication that we have a problem. Uh, the water stops. It's the water. <laughs> so how, what's the storage capacity of the, the tanks? Uh, that I don't know, but they're, they're pretty. It's they're pretty a wash. And the tens of thousands of gallons. What? And that's so, when I went toward it. And I'm sort of surprised it's not an alarm. That's, that's my question. Why is there not a hey, you have a problem alarm before we need to evacuate the building because we can't flush the toilet. I, I, I agree. In fact, I asked so Scott in the process while I was yeah, looking exactly. at this. So it should be some type of alarm that you can down to a low level alarm. Something. We, we talked to, uh, we, we called our water our water treatment guy. He came right out, was looking at, and he puts these things on. We said we want an alarm on here. So it's going to be added this summer. It should be like a couple hundred bucks. What's that? Should be a couple hundred bucks and yes, you exactly. a text message and everybody else a text message. Shouldn't be that big of a deal to add something. Yeah, for as big as those tanks are, this problem had to happen last week. Yeah. yeah. We just finally ran out. So, so just to be clear, when they were out to look at the well, they don't know yet if there's any kind of water issue in the well. They, they weren't now there's water in the well. There's water in the well. Last so that's, that's a good thing. There's water in the well. Kevin was there, dropped stones in there, saw the water, there's water in the well. So hopefully it'll get hoping it gets solved tomorrow morning. We'll keep everybody up, but they were able to get it's filling up a little bit. They got to the point where they were able to flush the toilets and stuff in the secondary building. Um, okay. Uh, hey, hey, Greg, hey Jim, Jim, this is Greg Clubon. Club on. Hi, Greg. Um, um, I wanted to, I wanted interject, to interject there a bit. There a bit. If the, if the um, um, cost to repair or replace is over our deductible and it can be determined that it's possibly from a lightning strike that's covered under our insurance if it gets really expensive okay. well Mr. I'm sure uh, Kevin Swank from Swank and Sun Pump and Wells well and well drilling and pump I think that's what it is he, uh, he plan to pull that and we'll get an assessment as soon as I know what's happening I'll get word out to the board where it's going okay um, next thing I want to talk about is next year because people are saying hey what are we doing next year what are we doing next year and believe me uh, the administrative team has been talking long and hard and actually board members have been talking um, long and hard so 
you know, have a little presentation of where we want to go for next year. Again, it's all for discussion. And one thing I want to let you know is we, we do have to still be flexible because things are constantly changing. It's not like a uh, stationary target where we can aim and there it is. The, that target is constantly moving. And um, again, what we hope for is, you know, if we had one theme is to get back to as normal as possible. It'd be great if we were normal pre-COVID. Now, I know lots of things in the world have changed since that. I don't know if we'll ever get back to pre-COVID, but um, as normal as we can. So a couple things we'll talk about, summer 2021, and then assumptions for the next school year. Uh, In-person instruction, so go cyber, and our health and safety plan. So first thing is, you know, we're gonna be doing a summer program using ESSER funding. Our, our schools right now are collecting the data. We're gonna identify the kids, we're gonna send invitations out. And this summer school is gonna run from July 6th to July 29th. Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 11.30, transportation will be provided. We'll provide snacks as well. And um, we're gonna be doing uh, a lot of great things for uh, the kids that wanna come and spend the, some time with us to address learning loss and or possibly enrichment. Um, that would be grades um, K to six and grades seven to 12. We'll have some credit recovery for kids who may have failed classes. We'll be using Edgenuity for that. Um, again, so grades one through six, interventions, remediation, skill building, all right there. Uh, the things we're going to be working on, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension and literacy, math, fact fluency, computation, number sense, mathematical reasoning. So there are a couple of the items we're going to be looking at taking care of um, in the summer school starting June, July 6th, it's a Tuesday. Okay, for next year, the assumptions for instruction will be in person. K-12 will be our default delivery, right? So if you don't say, hey, Southern Columbia, I want to go so SoCo Cyber, we're going to say you're coming full-time in person. The other one is SoCo Cyber that we run here through Edgenuity and Accelerate Ed. Um, through SoCo Cyber, we will have, and we'll talk about, the, we're going to survey the parents, try to get estimates of enrollments, but we do feel a large majority of our parents want to come back to in-person um, instruction. And again, our IEP accommodations, all that will be determined by the IEP team. One big thing for next year is we'd like to use the ESSA funds to do some after-school remediation, after-school tutor, again, providing transportation to those kids on like a late bus type of thing. Hey Jim, can I just say really quickly about SoCo Cyber? I know I've mentioned it before, wanting to make sure that those kids and parents that participated this year get a good exit interview about their experience. But if anybody's listening and you did SoCo Cyber this year, anything that you think would be helpful to improve the program, no matter how significant you think it might be, or if it's something individual to your circumstances, please share it with Mrs. Zygmunt so that we can make it as good as we can next year for those students who want to be part of Southern in that way. Um, and obviously we want to try and keep as many students as we can in our cyber program versus going out. Into exactly, and I know Mrs. Zygmunt and the counselors and principals have made contact with a lot of our Great. cyber kids beyond SoCo Cyber, but um, absolutely, any kind of feedback would be well welcome. Okay, in-person instruction, traditional site schedule, in person with students and teachers. We will remain one to one. We're grades three through 12 right now, one to one. But we were able to get uh, technology to kids who needed it in those other grades. Um, we could possibly use ESSER funds to go down further if needed. I'm not sure if that need is there. So we'll kind of do as need basis type of thing with the uh, one to one below third grade. Um, school closures. Um, we'd like to do synchronous instruction. That's if the law that says we can do 
virtual learning right now that ends at the end of this school year, if that's continued for next year, um, we're hoping that it will. I'm hearing it will. Um, the biggest thing is no, con no continuous dual mode of instruction. Um, that has been where the teacher has kids at home and kids here. That has been a, um, a struggle, to say the least, for some. Um, there's, been, there's been success stories. There's been stories of um, you know, not, so much, not so much positive experiences with this. But it is it is a, a difficult thing to do. Now, could have some exceptions to this. For instance, if a student's on quarantine, if a student has to be out of school for you know, seven to ten days or twenty days, then we might open up some synchronous instruction for that individual. If we have a homebound, now we probably had less than a half dozen students on homebound this year. Um, we might be able to use synchronous instruction during that for, that for that individual. So we're talking about very few times that we would have to do synchronous, this dual mode. We don't want to do it. If a kid's absent, then they can just, you know, because they'll choose to stay home for whatever reason. We want them here. We want so, them here. So with the exception, what you're saying is, is that we're still going to have the, the ability to do that in the classroom. Obviously, it would look differently in the middle and high school where students are moving class, moving to different classrooms, elementary school. If need be, and the student has to be homebound or quarantined, mm -hmm. it can be used for a temporary period of time. Absolutely. It's not going to be on all year. Right, exactly. Yeah. What happens to the additional planning time and planning days that we're, uh, so well, we're, we're looking into that. We'd like to try to get that morning time back. I mean, the reason we took the morning time is because we couldn't gather kids in groups. We're looking at possibly being able to do that. I think the earlier drop-off time in the elementary school worked tremendously. We had zero lines this year, which, well, not zero, but they weren't out there 487, so that worked pretty well. Um, we'd like to be able to get the kids in and stage them into the cafeteria as best we can and bring our buses in so they can be dropped off and go in but give our give our uh, teachers some planning time in the morning get that back to them. that's that's initial plan administratively we're looking at how we're going to do that would we keep teams rolling just in the background if so that they're sort of used to the best there when the student does go on quarantine or would it just be turned off on less of students on expected. No, I think I think most teachers are still going to use Teams. I, I had a teacher who said to me the other day she's going to record every one of her lessons so she can go back to it. But I think that's going to be a choice type of thing. I don't think we want to make it an asynchronous um, platform where teachers have to record all their, their lessons um, for uh, students who may have been absent today. Again, getting back to normal. If you're absent today, come back and get your work, that type of thing. Because if you're if you're sick, we want to say, if you're too sick to come to school, then you should be too sick to be doing work at home. How do we This year, it? this year was a little different because if you had symptoms, we asked you to stay home. We're hoping next year that we don't have that same or kind of just exposure. You may not even have symptoms, you could have just been exposed. Yeah, exactly. How do we pay for teams? Is that based off of like the amount of students we have using it? Or, like, or is there going to be, I mean, I mean we have, how many students here enrolled that we had to assume at some point would be using Teams. So I would imagine we paid more for Teams. Is there any sort of- Mr. Becker or Eli, or Mr. Yams, I'll jump in. So there's no additional price. Anything we did with Teams since March 13th of 2020, there has been no additional price because it falls under the, the agreement of our Microsoft agreement. So there's been zero price increase of anything we've done with Microsoft Teams. Thank you. I just want to make sure. That agreement, Mr. Davis, that's because that agreement provides the Microsoft Office suite for every student, right? That's every correct. Student. That and is correct. Um, and staff. We pay for that. So yeah. We're, we've already paid for it. We're not paying additional, but we paid for it. Yeah, I just didn't know if there was correct. tiers or stuff, but okay, yeah, sure. And additionally, server licenses as well, too. Okay. Thank you. Teams is going to remain available to all teachers. Yeah, absolutely. It. And if they want to record the first class of the day or whatever it is in the high school, so that way it's available, they can do that, but we're not going to mandate it. Absolutely. And, and, and again, I think a lot of our teachers will use it. 
you know, as as you know, a, 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 a resource a, for them and their kids. Or yeah. somebody that's out sick to be able to have that 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 time of listening to a, a, a teacher being able to teach a topic. I'd, rather than trying to learn it themselves, they're having to come in and have right. just, you know, separate time or trying to make it up some other way. And there's so many things with teams, like I said, it's a line of communication, it's a way to uh, transfer documents back and forth to each other. Yeah. So is it's thing? also assessment. A lot of our, our staff use it for assessment, which I, I, I actually continue think they'll continue to use. Uh, there's there's just a multitude of, of possibilities that you can do with it. I, some of the staff I talk to, I, I believe they're going to continue to use it. I think you have to remember Teams just is not the video component. Teams also brings a lot of other aspects of assessment and content uh, and discussion into the mix. The video part of it was just one one part of it where there's additional parts of Microsoft Teams. I was more thinking along the lines of what you were saying, not that you would ever live stream an answer in six feet in the home, but just that it, there is some value if you just record it that when the student is healthy, they can go back and watch the, the couple hours of instruction. To me, it's just a thought to you know, see if teachers want to get in the habit of doing that all the time, not hard and fast on. Similar to college classes, you know, a lot of places where I went to college, the teachers all recorded their lessons, and then when you were studying for exams, you couldn't go back if you were struggling with them. Mr. Davis, I have one additional question since we're talking technology. Yeah, go ahead. I know several school districts utilize the Google Education Suite, um, but I don't know if they're still buying a Microsoft Office subscription, the you know, watered down for email. Do you have any idea of what they're doing for their email component? Our school or for, for other schools, Mr. Hoagland? I'm sorry. Just asking if, if you've looked into that based on what other schools are doing. Yeah, so so what Google and Microsoft do is very, very similar anymore. So you, Google has their G Suite, and basically what Microsoft has done is just increase what they're, they kind of, it's Microsoft Teams, basically. Um, my, my reasoning for that is G Suite is an additional cost. Uh, we did have some few, te few teachers that were interested in that. Um, but in comparing the two, in my opinion, they're very, very similar. And I, I didn't think it was necessary to go out and spend more money for, for tools that we already have, as Mr. Majeski, or I'm not sure who I'll mention it, that we, we kind of already paid for because of our Microsoft blanket like kind of coverage, I guess you would say. Um, they're, they're very similar tools. We did research it and look into it. I actually did get some uh, price quotes probably back in the fall. I don't remember what those quotes were, but it was additional money. When does our Microsoft agreement expire? That we Jul would July with? 1. It's, a, it's renewed annually. So, I mean, the time is approaching to make a decision on. A so, so I, re, I already budgeted for, for that uh, just because if, if I would have to pull that, boy, that would change our whole environment server wise. Uh, you know that from our HVAC server to our security camera server, uh, that would just be a, a totally different outlook for us. Maybe that's something I can follow up in in person at some other time. I don't want to take up the whole night. All right, Jim. Do you have anything else for? Not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, talking about our SoCo Cyber again. Online, asynchronous, edgenuity for grades 7, 6 to 12, edge, uh, accelerate ed for grades 5, K to 5, we're using ESSA funds to provide that for now. We will provide one to one device for anyone doing SoCo Cyber. Uh, benchmarks, this is something that where our major problem, with, problem is with our online learning is. Students were falling behind with some of the work. So what we like to do is set benchmarks for completed work. Um, that would show good progress towards finishing the courses or courses that they're doing. Um, again, we will have special ed support from our people. Um, again, it will require parental requests. Um, students would be able to come back to SoCo 
uh, leave Soco Cyber, come back to Southern Columbia in person after the first marking period. Um, it, it's hard for them to, we don't want them to go too far, but we have to give them an opportunity to get to, again, we talked about a benchmark. We're looking at marking periods being benchmark times. So once we get to a first marking period and realize, hey, kid's not doing well, we're going to try to encourage them to come back to in-person learning. Um, and that would be, the, and they can they can switch then every marking period. Come back and, and at the end of a marking period. We're hoping that you want to come back in the middle of a, mark, of a marking period. What about uh, hot spots? Excuse me. Hot spots. Well, I think I think well we, we would have to do hot spots as well because if we don't do hot spots. Other side of schools, school right. will do hot spots. So I think that has to be incorporated in our. So we would offer a hot spot? Yes. Well, a one to one device, including the hot spot. Okay. Just, Mr. Becker, <clears throat> I came across something the other day that says Emergency Connectivity Fund. Have you guys looked into that or heard anything about it? It's a FCC $7 billion order um, allows schools to seek reimbursement for purchasing hot spots and random things like that. Mr. Serafini, I actually reached out to uh, the IU about that last week because, yeah, it came across my email and I kind of got excited. Um, the person, and I, Jennifer Fawzi at the IU does all of our E-rate, uh, kind of our forms. I reached out to her, I think, Thursday or Friday, and she said she was kind of trying to digest it, how it would affect the school districts and stuff, and kind of would get back to me. Because I definitely saw that and I got kind of excited by that as well. So I'm kind of going to communicate with, with Mrs. Fawzi at the IU and see what her recommendations are. Yeah, I, I just know I saw it come through a, a whole slew of different channels that came out of like the state curriculum. Um, actually, I don't even know that. I think it was primarily out of technology, um, but I can pass any information that I can come across along on that. Okay, so some, some assumptions for our health and safety plan for next year. I'm sure there'll be some type of social distancing involved um, again where we would where we really have to adjust and again we have to be flexible depending on what the guidelines are like right now in the elementary school is three feet but yet in the cafeteria we still have to remain six feet because of taking the masks off now will all that change if vaccinations happen and I sure um, hope they come up with the, the guidelines and, and recommendations before uh, August 31st yeah, yeah exactly because um, again, those guidelines could change regarding the quarantine. Um, and again, modification of schedules if you have to go virtual. Um, and again, these back we talked about vaccinations, and, and I I may I like to promote vaccinations. I think it's important that people get it. If I if I had a student in school and he was of age, he or she would be going to get it. Um, I think the the benefits weight and again, my personal opinion, benefits outweigh the risk tremendously and also you know it could get, first of all you get get rid of these things get that's a big thing also one big thing is quarantining if the quarantining stays with it if you've been exposed and you haven't been vaccinated now you're getting removed from school you're getting removed from your activity um, you know so a lot of that you know is important to the kids so if that's important to you as a student important as a parent you know, vaccination solve these things. So I think it's very important that we really promote that vaccinations. And then again, flexibility um, in in uh, what we're doing as the guidance comes down. Any comments or, I know we talked a little bit as we went through. Uh, in regards to the uh, SoCo Cyber coming back after a marking period, so are you, is it that you're requiring students to commit per marking period? And then, yeah, so like that's first marking like. period, they can go cyber. Second marking period, they come in person. Third, they go back to cyber. Are you allowing that? <laughs> well, we're hoping that if they come back, they stay, they stay here. here. Okay. Once the, once we once we have them here, and they can see what kind of supports we can give them, I don't know if we would lose them again. Sure. Because then we're just going to point right back to it. When you weren't here, you weren't successful. Sure. So. So, and, and that's what we're trying to, you know, all, all of our cyber kids, whether they're SoCo cyber or cyber, outside cyber, we're, we're touching base with them, we're making phone calls, 
Um, some of the phone calls that we can't touch, we're making plans to go home visits, knock on doors, and see how people, you know, will re, you know, will re receptive to us, and talk to them about what we can offer and try to get them back, because we feel this is the best place for them to be. Sure. Okay. Um, I think that is. Let me refresh here for one second. Okay. Yeah, turn it over to Mrs. Crusher. You just giving us a brief on your changes. There's a lot in here. A lot of changes. Not a lot of changes, but there's a lot of information. Um, Josh Majewski helped me um, go through some um, assessments and just giving us more data to so that the board has more information to make decision on um, a tax increase. So let's get started here. Um, first slide. Again, we went over this last week. Um, this is what the budget includes. Jim, that's just the PDF. You should be able to just scroll. So it has all the core subjects, music, art, physical education, technology education, family and consumer sciences, athletics, student activities, savings to support the Botech building project, and savings toward the turf replacement. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, these are the updates since um, last Monday. Um, we had a confirmation of a decrease in health care of 5%. Um, which was fantastic news for us because we were projected to have a 7% increase. So um, that was really wonderful news. Um, the charter school and other um, institutions, educational associations out, outside of our district, we, had a, we analyzed all the data that we had um, and projected uh, the month of May and June for bills that we do not have in yet. And we're projecting an increase of 1% um, in the budget in that area. That was a huge increase um, that um, we've been waiting to kind of do that uh, what's, what's analysis. The Pardon? 1% of the total budget? Of the, to of, um, the tuition the, budget. What's the dollar amount approximately? We're going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so. Going to the next slide, we're going to look at the expenditures. So our total proposed final expenditures, and this is by um, sub-function, is $22,873,848. And the top four expenditures are still regular education, special education, our debt service, and transportation. When we get to this next slide, um, so the budget changes due to the charter schools and the other um, tuition for students that are, we don't offer the program here and they go to another school for that program. Um, the charter school increase was 248000 from our original budget and the other um, increase was 42000 from the original budget. So the total increase to the budget is approximately 1%. You can see that here in this the dark blue um, pie chart here. Um, there's a, a 1%. Jim, could you go full screen on that for for the public here at least if you could? It should be in the middle there by 100%. And that works too, there you go. So it's the, like screen. the navy color blue or the, the really dark blue. And you can see the other um, areas, salaries, the green, um, and benefits is the other biggest part of our budget. That change is significant. I mean, one percent is a lot. A lot. Yes. Which is why um, we have everyone contacting the students that are out of district to try to bring those kids back here because they are a huge cost to the district. At what point do those numbers come in? Well, we pay them monthly, so the last ones that I had before Monday were back from February, and then I just projected out 
Okay. The rest. So these are estimated numbers, and then we sat down as a team this week, and we picked through all of the um, data that we had. Because just because I paid a bill for that doesn't mean because initially when I sent you guys the update, um, I had projected it to be about six hundred thousand total. Um, so after we sat down and we picked through it, we were able to eliminate kids that had already come back or maybe left the district and that kind of thing, so we came up with a better number. Because we originally uh, estimated 200000 for that, correct? 215000 okay. is what and I had so budgeted. And I did the same last year, but it's more of a trend, so I'm really, we're really increasing it this year to cover that trend that had so, been happening. So more than doubles. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that number, though? Now, you have to keep in mind, last year was a COVID year. Um, so more yeah. kids were going to those types of programs, and the trick will be is if we can get them to come back because we really want them to be back here with our district. What what mechanisms do we have other than begging people to come back to get people to come back? Like this is significant. So I mean, it, it seems like the state's going to do nothing to fix the actual problem. We're going to be required to continue to pay. Whatever tuition is set externally for whatever student chooses to go that path, what what recourse do we have? Where where does it end? Should we just tell everybody to go to cyber charter so that it reduces our? I mean, it'll reduce the formula then for us. I think I think we have to we have to get more active in, in with our legislators and really um, you know show them more of the detail and how this is happening. I mean. We're a brick and mortar school, a cyber school. What they don't have the the brick and mortar expenses that we have. So we have to. I, I believe schools. Have they're not going to listen. They yeah. haven't listened in the last four or five years, and they're not going to listen now. Is Carl on the call? No. Carl's not. Don't we okay. Are. So one of the things that I found today is because these are public charter schools, we can approve brick and mortar charter schools. My question to Carl is, do we get that same approval authority for cyber charter schools? Because they, they built that in so that if they're not meeting certain metrics that your school district thinks are necessary for a brick and mortar, they come off the list of ones that people are allowed to attend. I know we've had a lot of issues with students coming back from some of these cyber charter schools because they are not quality education. I'm not saying that's all of them, but I know that is a recurring theme amongst a lot of them. It would be nice if we could, in fact, review and strike some of these not that good programs off that list. And, and Josh, it's my experience that we don't have that ability. Um, <clears throat> and, and we have looked at, you know, cyber school performance. We have talked to legislators, groups of superintendents have put on uh, presentations for legislators. It's being pushed at the, the state level from some uh, administrative organizations to try to get at least fair funding um, out of so many cyber schools. And as Tim said, it's about. So what happens if this board refuses to approve a payment to so these charter schools that are so it, gets, it automatically comes out of our basic it education funding. Our, we don't get a choice. They deduct yeah. it. So then why do we approve it at all? I, so from now on, we're voting no. So for every budget book, for every monthly bill approval for invoices, I want charter schools pulled separate, so that we can vote on that separately. Yeah, I'll vote because yeah. I'm going to vote no if we if, if if we have no control over it. And I mean, they they you control our budget, check, right? We have no control over so, our budget. How are we supposed to plan? So if we don't approve it, you can't pay them. I, I agree. I, I mean, I agree. for for schools that have demonstrated high performance and that that we feel are providing a comparable level of education that the board is tasked with. But that's that's what our job is, is to provide education to the, the students in this district. We have the ability for brick and mortar charter schools to make that assessment. Why do we not have it for cyber schools? And if you're saying that we, regardless of whether we vote to approve an invoice or not, it's going to be deducted, then I, I vote no. I can figure it out. And we'll go from there. Maybe somebody will actually start to pay attention if we stop paying the bill. I like that plan. It's still going to be deducted for our Sure. I, okay, so we'll plan for that accordingly, but I'm going to vote no. So, I mean, everybody else do whatever you want, but I would like to ask for that to be pulled out separately, just prepared for that breach. Okay. Monthly. Yeah. 
So my question, because I mean, I was very confused. We talked about, so we expected $200,000, and then we ended up going up towards 600000 and we worked that down a little bit. Um, was it just like in the past week or so that the numbers of students came no, in? No, I've been that talking we... to you guys since February when I gave the uh, budget um, presentation then. I told you that that was one of the items that we still had to sure. adjust in the budget. Okay, so the numbers for the students just came in then that we Well, I just school. finally got to that point where I had was able to analyze it all and okay. get the budget changed. We should adjust this budget last year. And, and again, what I, it was one of those things, it was COVID, I was new coming in. We didn't look at that numbers and costs as we did. So this year I was looking at costs and they made it hurt me. We, from last year to this year, our numbers didn't go up. They went up, not great. It was the year prior that they were down low and they went up, I think we were at 14 to 15 kids and they went up to 28. So that's... So we're up 100% over budget in charter school expenses yeah. this year. Yeah. So hypothetical, what if we had passed this budget last week and passed on taking out a bond to pay for both tax, and then I find out that we're 400,000 short a week later? Well, you wouldn't have passed the budget last week because we're not at that point. But this is sort of that this was a really big deal, and I'm not quite getting the warm and fuzzy that everybody feels this is a really big deal. I feel there's a really big deal, too. There's two parts of this. One is our inability to control whether or not we actually pay for and what we're getting for what we're paying for when it comes to cyber charter school. And then separately, the fact that we didn't realize this until today or this weekend. I think there are two different things. One, we have control over, and that's like, why wasn't it in the how did we miss it? Yeah, that, that's my concern. That's my I question. Think. It's like, at what point did we realize these numbers were? Yes. Traditionally, this is the time that I would look at that particular item. Okay. <clears throat> but I mean, but we had the increases. Like, so. For all the other things that we've been looking at, what percent of budget are we on athletics? What percent of budget are we on uniform expenses? <laughs> the level of detail that we've been looking at things that are $1,000 in the budget. How did we miss? Three hundred thousand dollars this past year that we're we're going to be over budget for the past year by three hundred k. Like right? yeah. that that's the question that, that yeah. I have. And, and that's what I mean. Mr. Becker and I talked about that, and so when we met with the team, we already set up on the calendar for next year to look at this much closer in January um, than waiting till this point. This is the point I just had it on my calendar for years. Um, so my bad for not looking at it sooner. Is this something that can be looked at like monthly? Yeah. Because as you pay your invoices and pay, I mean, well, well we're no, not going to do that anymore. Yeah, but as we look at those, as we get them in and see them, like, I mean, we should be doing it, I would think, probably I regularly. Think, I, I do know what you're saying, Eli, but we have um, three people besides myself on staff to do all the statistics we've been trying to do. And some of it is new to us. We are working on it. and we're going as fast as I can. I had a, a request this afternoon at close to 5 o'clock to change some things for tonight. I try to get them done as much as I can, and I will do them. Yeah, I'm not trying to attack you. I mean, I approved these invoices for the past yeah, so eight right. months, too. Like, it's not just you. I'm just trying to say, like, how so do we go forward how, with how this? How do we fix it, though, going forward? Like, so for tracking purposes? I think we need to, you know, look at it. Not just this. Like, so what is the... So I'm saying for every part of the budget, mm -hmm. why is there not at least a quarterly, here's where we thought we'd be, and here's where we are, percent to budget, right? And then we at least have and, a and shot we, at catching. We do have the ability to do that with our new software. So okay. we, we can actually produce. So that, I mean, that's, that should be more frequent than quarterly than anything that's software, given, right? Should be pretty straightforward. I think, I think we can, that's, Part of that transparency document, what yeah. I like to have is a, a spending a date, and every month it gets up. If it is doable without adding much burden on you or your team, I'd like to see it each month as part of the invoice approval. Is it the tuition paid year round, or is it only during the months of school? Pardon? The tuition. Is it paid year round? 10 months out of the year. 10 it's months out of the well, year. Well, so it, it might be like 11. I'm sorry. I think it's 11. It's July through May, I believe, is the last payment. So it looks um, like you're at about what thirty six thousand a month. 
ish. Give or take, yeah. But that's right around where we're at right now. Um, and just glance through the invoice. Well, let's sort of finish no, through, the presentation through our, and then we'll ask before. Yeah, through our checking, we did, we did um, identify a couple of kids that, you know, and again, part of it was, you know, a meeting that we had this week that we said, hey, we need to change some of our questions, we need to do some of our things a little, you know, ask some harsh questions along the way. Um, the one cyber school gave us a, a credit of $17,000 back because these kids were no longer in our district going back to um, what, March or, or, or February. It was, no, it was, it was October. Couple, so back to... Well, there was only, it was only it was, there was three kids and they yeah. were special ed students, so... Is there an auditing of that? Because like that $17,000, would you guys have known about it? Would we have known about we it did. had they not so, been in good grace to just send so it to So one us? of the things we implemented this year um, in regards to charter schools, um, because we have um, Nicole Heim as our PIMS um, director. So when those bills come in, they go to Nicole first for verification to make sure that those are indeed our students and that we're um, only paying for our students. This particular charter school continued to bill us throughout that time. She's been working fighting with them, trying to get that bill straightened out. And it finally, so from like October till just in the April, the month of April, it finally got resolved. Got so we are implementing some new things in the office, trying to catch up with all this charter school stuff. And really, because it is so expensive, we want to make sure that we're only paying for our own students. Is there so. any... Is there any way we can go look back and see at maybe some other instances where we paid for students that weren't there and see about collecting that? I mean, is there like, I mean, because this is only that past like how long that we've been checking to verify well, this. Well, Nicole's been doing it pretty much from the time she took that position. So this year was the first year that she caught that she someone. Caught okay. um, so I don't know with Anne Marie before that. Um, sure. If, Anne Marie was doing that system, but we are doing that. Some of our some of the cyber students again. We don't have all that many. We know who they are. We we know this year so many people left. We know who they are. We know where they live. That type of thing. Some cyber students have been in cyber for ten years already, so we know that. What draws a flag on us is some of these new kids. They like we we got three kids that showed up and they were here. How, how does their residence get confirmed? Like, to, to enroll your kid in kindergarten or yeah. first grade here, you have to bring a, a deed, yeah. a water bill. Yeah. Every school's different. Like, I'm on the board and I had to prove that I live here. Yeah. yeah. Right? For, my, for each of my three children yeah. last year coming to kindergarten. Well, and, 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 and every school has different, like our school, our, we, our policies are pretty tough. But to go to a cyber school, they don't even have to register here. We get notified from the cyber school that they've registered and they've showed proof of residency. Can we can we verify though that like the student that they're charging us for is indeed well, in our area? And if not, why are we paying for them? Well, well exactly. That's how we caught three of them. Okay. And we have a couple that we haven't since we haven't had contact with them, we're trying to reach out to them. Calling, I think, like, a lot of these members, and if you're unable to get a hold of the families, we're putting them on a separate list to do a follow-up. Yeah. Yeah. We do have at least seven that I've called that are coming back next year. Um, they just were at the point we have some students who went from other places and straight to cyber, so we had no idea. Now, those seven, those seven students that are, you know, they gave us verbal, again, times the 12, 13,000, you're looking at 80, 90,000 dollars. That's still in the budget because they didn't give, they did not register yet, so we had to keep that in the budget. Now they've they've told us they're coming back. Right? We still have to keep that in the budget. Mm -hmm. I mean, so for definitely for these approval of monthly invoices that we're going to separate out, right? for whatever students are on those, I want the district to tell me that they actually live in the district or they don't before, even before I vote no. I, I, yeah. That that seems like a reasonable requirement to set before we pay a tuition bill for someone who doesn't even live in the district potentially. Yeah? Yep. Or not fully. Right. 
I mean, if they're not responding, you send them a certified letter. If they don't well, again, respond, we're making, they don't we're leave, making plans to go visit. We're making plans to go visit a couple of them. And again, we're talking about a small number of, of yeah. people that we haven't contacted. We, we've contacted and some have said, no, we're not coming back. Some, we like it. We like what we're doing. Whatever. Um, again, it's a small number. And so Josh asked, Josh Hoagland asked for Carl's opinion on, do you still want that? Do you want your yeah, actual opinion right now? I, I, it's my experience. Yeah. I think I'm not a lawyer, but it's the, the brick and mortar school, cyber schools, uh, have to go by a different set of rules. The cyber, because they could be anywhere, they can take any sure. kid from any district. Sure. I would like to know from Carl what the ramifications are if the board votes no on payments. I, I understand that he says that it's just going to come out anyway, but what are the actual legal consequences of this? I want, I'd like a formal legal opinion from our solicitor on what happens if we don't do this. It can be held in confidence, it doesn't need to be made public, it can be board only. I want to know what the legal ramifications are in his opinion we choose not to pay these bills. For whatever reason. I mean, for no reason or for actual legitimate reason if we have yeah, My concern is just like, this is, I mean, this was significant. I mean, this completely changed our whole conversation from last Monday. So, like I said, I'm not trying to pin any blame. I, I've approved the past I guess, eight months of the. Uh, it's just expense, uh, expenditures, but it's just, I think we need to get a hold of this. But you're approving what you're showing. Correct, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I still accept responsibility for that, but it's just a matter of, you know, keeping on top of this right Right, and I think to address that from a, from a board oversight standpoint, the monthly percent to budget, what, where should we have been at for each of these line items and where are we? Yeah. And if the software can produce that very quickly without additional burden on the team, right, that's a very quick check. You know, we should be at, at X dollars and we're twice that already, right? At any point throughout the year, that would call someone's attention. To yeah, red flag. Okay. okay, next slide. Okay, the next slide has, um, you can go on to the next one. It's the, um, this is from the CEPR system, the state, the state system that um, I have to enter all the data into. So this is the revenue, and what I do is I just took um, all four sheets that I would print it out, and I just kind of pasted them together so you could see them side by side, what those revenue um, numbers look like from the real estate a standpoint. So if we go down to the next slide, it's a better view of what that um, revenue is. Looking at the total revenue that we would bring in, um, and you would have to choose between the 3.9 index down to the 2.5, and um, that would be that's all total in the revenue would would be um, the local funds, the state funds, and the um, federal funds together. And the expenditures stay the same across. There's no change based on um, index. So this is with 80,000 for VOTEC? 80,000 for VOTEC, 50,000 for um, the turf. turf. Yes. So and all the cyber school increases. Right. So this dramatically swings that discussion that we had last week. Yes. Of do we borrow or not? And some of that discussion last week, the decision on to raise taxes by what amount was, can we actually swing this without borrowing? That affects, right. like, I, I'm at a lower raise now. Like, I, I don't see any reason to do even three if we're going to have to borrow. But. Well, how much is that turf going to cost when it's all? I mean, I know we're allocating for it 500, now. $500,000. At what point? Uh, 10 between 10 and 12 years. And, uh, from and strip is maybe from, from, maybe from the install. From install, which was about seven. And is there a huge argument for not just, is there any argument for deferring that? One. Is that deferring replacing it? Well, what are you going to do? You, you, if you, if you don't replace it, then play away games only. Play away games, or, I mean, there was a field underneath it before. I mean, it's just. It's not there anymore. It's gone. Yeah. 
they stripped everything off of it when they put it in. Yes, layers of we're, we're stuck with the field. If they go back now, it doesn't make sense. There's a about a foot of sand and gravel and rubber underneath that turf. So if you were to remove that, you would also have to come in. We excavate out all the gravel and under drain to put the grass and top to back. Okay. I figured I'd just ask. Yep. Good. That's a very good question. So the next slides, I'm going to let Josh chime in here because he um, helped me with these um, slides, thankfully. So um, I just put some data in here. We're looking at the 3.9% tax increase for 2021-22, uh, looking at um, the number of parcels to the um, left and then going by 10 yeah, so the, the bottom axis is, those are bins, each section is a bin. So the first first bar there is a change in taxes from zero to $10 per parcel. The next would be uh, $10.01 $10 to $25 per parcel, for a given parcel and so on and so forth, $25.01 up to 50 and all the way over, right? So that's the number of parcels that would see that um, somewhere in that range of tax increase if we raise 3.9%. And there's a graph of each of these for each of the four. And I, that were. I just put in there for your reference the, the revenue that that would bring in. I thought this was really interesting just to look at because we, we do talk about the median and the average um, never talk about the maximum or what that distribution looks like, right? So the median just tells you right here in the middle of all the parcels, right? So if we say the median is somewhere in the $40 or $50 range for this raise, which I, I think is where it actually comes out, maybe 50 or 60. 33, I think, or something. Um, right. There's still a substantial number of parcels being taxed at three times that as you get out to the 150. Right, and then it trails off into the tail. Uh, the out in that six, where there's more than a thousand, um, that also includes like Great Dane in in Ralpho Township, right? Like so, some major commercial That's significantly, as well. significantly um, more. Right. So when you get out in that bigger number, it, there are some commercial properties included there in the mix, but. Uh, and this so, is without the homestead, farmstead. This is without the exclusion. Without the, uh, the homestead bond that said exclude. And this is just the difference from the 0% index. Yeah. And this is across both towers? Yes. This this is all this is all all tax paying municipalities within the district. I don't know if it's included later. There's a, a breakdown by municipality even. Um, yeah, I have it, it's like coming this, later. Okay. Just medians and, and whatnot. Yeah. I just did them all in yeah. single slides so that it was readable because sometimes we can't see the things. So here again, it's the 3.5 index, the 3.0, and 2.5. So there's a there's a substantial number that are in the you know ten dollars or less change even for the 3.9 percent, and that. When we talk about the median or the mean, those numbers really they have, they skew that they skew that assessment, yeah. right? Like so, if you only talk about the fifty, like last year we said repeatedly, the median this only increases the median tax bill by thirty or fifty, mm -hmm. somewhere in that thirty to fifty dollar range, depending on which county you were in, right? But the reality is, it, it impacts a lot of parcels significantly more than that, right? It, does that mean we should change our path? I, I don't know. I'm not. That's not what I'm arguing. I just wanted to make sure everybody saw the data rather than continuing to say it's only going to cost the taxpayer twenty bucks when yeah. it costs several taxpayers much it's, more. It's really good information for everyone to see. I mean, it's, it's kind of skewed a little too because you know you consider that from the first, I guess from from there, from the two thousand one or seventy one people that pay uh, fifty and less, um, that is. A smaller level of increase than to the right because the people on the right now you just go over 
you know, three blocks, it's a hundred dollars more instead of that. So it's just something. I mean, to consider that the people on the right are still paying considerably more. Next slide. And these are the next ones, the, the notional 2021-22 uh, property tax bills. Um, and this is another slide that um, Josh prepared where he broke down um, by the municipalities. And uh, this one's the median tax increase. For a, for a parcel, median parcel tax increase. I put the medians up there just yep. for reference. The, the increases that they would see. And here's the average. It's interesting, the averages are higher than the median. Because of the, just the way it's all skewed. Uh -huh. And here's the maximum increases. Different than 50 bucks for something. Yeah, they have to be considered some of these are commercial properties. Some of these are commercial properties. Some of these are you know, high residential. Value residential properties. Sure. And it's higher because it's a higher tax assessment for whatever reason. And yeah. That's why they are a, a larger chain. I'm not saying these individuals can't pay it. I'm not saying they can. Just this is the data. Yeah, yeah. So this is the other piece, the property tax relief for the Farmstead Homestead um, Act One um, property tax um, reduction. We receive we're going to be receiving 295,000 approximately for this year. So the, the reductions are applied directly um, to the assessment. So it's subtracted directly from the assessment. So Columbia County has a 1,687 dollar reduction to the assessment, Northumberland County, $1,271 um, uh, reduction. And this equals approximately $90 to every tax bill for everyone that's approved as a homestead or farmstead. And then the bottom numbers just tell you how many homesteads and farmsteads that Columbia and Northumberland County have that are approved. And this is just the millage, um, looking at the millage um, compared to the 2021. A mill is about $160,000 for the two counties combined. Um, so that is that piece. Go ahead, Jim. Okay, I'm gonna have to share now. Um, I had a, um, Josh had asked me to do some um, comparisons so he could see um, some things. So I need to be able to share. Yeah. If you're going to share, you need to be on step two. Where do I find that? We have to plug in over here. We have to change things. Oh, here. We have to change things. Oh, here. We have to change things. Oh, for, for now, we'll go right to the stuff that we need to vote on, and then we can come back to the committee report because we're probably going to run out of time. So I just want to get that those motions and stuff. We'll do the agenda hearing period after she's done. What's that? We have to do the agenda hearing period. Yeah, after. yeah, we'll do that and we'll vote on the stuff. Then we'll go back to committee reports. Okay. Which facilities is only one thing, and we won't do a finance one because we're doing it now. We right? don't take us nothing. Results of today's. Uh, community meeting on learning loss and right. pass forward. So we can do all that after. Yeah. Your meeting. Thanks. <laughs> Along for the ride. Okay. Uh -huh. I can see that very good.
So these are the projections that um, we've been using, um, and I, all the data that's in the background is what has been uploaded to CFER. So all this, the the revenues and the expenditures. Um, will you make match. that bigger, Denise. So one of the things. Um, Thank you. That. Um, Mr. Hogan wanted to look at was he wanted um, we want to look down at he wanted to see some things broken out so the other purchase services um, number of the 500s which are right here um, so this is the tuition of students going to other schools that we um, currently aren't offering those programs here. This is the tuition for the um, charter schools, uh, the tuition for Votech. And I broke out the transportation, um, so the public transportation would be for our public students, and then we also transport non-public students, so that's the number for that um, they broke out. What are the 400? Uh, 400, this, this is, um, so this is the savings. So that's just um, an account that's in the 400s for that I can save um, if we're planning to save money for the Votech type project. That it, we have to put that in as an expenditure. It doesn't actually like it won't go into the fund balance till the following year after the audit is done, and then you'll take that and you'll say you know that you want to assign that to. Um, for, for future building projects. Sorry, the, the one right above that, the 355,600. Services, contracted right. services. Right below. 400. This one? It goes from 283 up to 355. Well. From this year to next. Well, yeah, from year. between here to here. Uh, I'm just wondering, what what is that actually? Um, That could be like our, let me, let me look a minute. Okay. So I make John you the right thing here. So let's look at Okay, so most of that's copiers. Um, there would be budget items for um, mostly it looks like repairs and maintenances um, in elementary. I'm just going to see if I can get this out of here. Utility service that you talk about electric or? Um, repairs and maintenance service. It could be like um, things that would be. Um, on the, like the the laminators, for example, that you might need to have something repaired or something like that. Um, the 442s are copiers. Um, the the eighty thousand is the, is um, ninety four ninety. Oh, there is no. <laughs> <laughs> we lost every <laughs> This one is twenty three sixty. That is um, again. That's a copier. Four thirty. That's um, principles. But there's not much in that one. The buildings and grounds is the twenty six twenty is sixty two five hundred and one hundred two five hundred uh, or one hundred two thousand five hundred. So in each of these um, projections, you're going to see that this, the expenditures are all the same. The only thing that changes in this is actually the revenue, and then you can 
because you can see how, looking out here, how that affects the fund balance in the final years or the surplus or um, deficit. I, I don't need it, obviously, today, but that, that major uh, like $72,000 bump from this year and next year and that 400 services, didn't know if there was a, a main, I know you went down through them there, but if there was a main thing that we were replacing or doing that we have to budget for. And again, it, it, this is something that you, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'll go back and look and see. Like I said, it, it just is a major jump there. Yeah. And I know the rest of them remain the same because that's just uh -huh. projections, but yeah. it's just a, a, a big jump there from what we saw. I was just curious if there was something that we have to budget for that. So the other one that um, Mr. Hoagland asked about was the um, 700s. So if you look at um, last year compared to this year, um, there was um, items that were in the 800 that should have actually been in the 700s, and I just reclassified that from an 800 to a 700 to make sure it was where it needed to be. talking about uh, with the 400s that 80,000 actually is the savings for both that. Okay. That's what it is. I'm sorry. So then are we yeah. double budgeting for that? Um, no, I'm just pulling it over um, separately. Okay. Let me make sure though because uh, there's so many links in here. No, so if you look at the if you look at the formula um, there in the four hundreds, so I take it from my pivot table and then I subtract it out the next cell because I'm pulling it in on the top. Yeah, I see. I'm, yeah. I'm just trying yeah. to. Read. No. I see it up there. I just yeah. What I was looking at with no, I sorting. That's the line item budget. So that's what I actually upload into the state. Okay. System, so. so then there's still a big jump. Well, yeah, that's why I just asked. I, just asked I, look into yeah. I just need to pull out the uh, all the 400s for last year and see. Okay. It kind of asked a question. Yeah. If we're just going to keep asking these questions, do we need the administrators for any reason? What are they? <laughs> yeah. What's their, what do you, do you guys have? Yeah. I have one question for them. Okay. For who? I had a question for Jim. Oh, Jim's not here. I'm just talking to these guys. Well, oh, it's it, for both. No. Sorry. Okay. That's all I have for the budget presentation. Is there any? Are there any more questions? And we're we're obviously not voting on a final budget tonight. No, this is a proposed final or a final proposed budget, um, and I just need to know, um, like which one you're going to choose for tonight's um, exercise. And basically we're going to, you can change your mind till next week or till we do the final. It, it's fine, we're basically gonna be voting on the expenditures. I agree with, I mean, Josh brought it up, but I, I tend to agree, I mean, it looks like we're not going to be able to pay for this unless we really use almost all of the ESSER funds in cash because we're not going to be able to save the 600 k this year plus you know the amount that we have to put towards it this year. So it looks like the only way that we're going to finance this is not paying cash for it. I was going to say, just to finish point, do we want to discuss this whole thing with the question? I know we can talk and get out of here. Yeah. Well, I don't care, but we can yeah, if you discuss it afterwards. That's fine. If you want to ask your question or whatever it is, and 
but then we have to get out of here much bigger and sit for the rest of the night. You, know? <laughs> you look very tall. <laughs> I, I'm fine anyway, but I'm just asking you guys if, if we want to confer. I'll we'll, we'll, we'll we'll get a bath card number line in 45 minutes. So that's right. Mr. President, and ask, ask away. That way uh, they can go. While we're under the superintendent part, I just had two quick questions. Did you have any student or parent complaints logged this past month? Obviously, don't say what they were. Uh, yes, we had, yes. Well, there was one today, but then there was another one earlier this month. And are they coming through the new reporting system on the website, or just are they coming in as emails? It's an email or a phone call. Okay. Um, the other one, I was looking for an update on teacher reviews. Have we, how have we done this year on teacher reviews, both formal and informal topics? Okay. Um, we, we, we still have some way to go. With some of this, um, me and administration have talked about this. Um, there were a hundred, there were hundred walkthroughs in the elementary school, um, two in the high school, ten in the middle school. Um, uh, formal observations: high school, everyone was done. Um, elementary school, everyone was um, done or working on a um, differentiated observation and the same with middle school everyone who was doing a formal observation um, is done and we're all their differentiated um, evaluation what would you have expected the number should have been more like if you're saying that what to do? I, I, I would I mean I, I would think that we could easily hit every teacher three times so it's open which would be what number I was thinking three for for walkers throughout yeah. the year so that so close 102 102 and 10 were the number you gave what should they have been 100 100 100 is that partly a product of all the craziness going on this year i'm sorry is that partly a product of all the craziness going on this year i would think there's a number of different things um i think you know after um actually drew asked me this um question um a couple of weeks ago and then he and i talked um but after that administration, I have sat down and um, we reflected on what was happening. Um, we need to know we need we know we need um, to put some training forth, and that's already being set up. Um, there's there's training evaluation training at the IU, um, which we're going to be involved with um, as like the um, cyber school. We're going to set benchmarks and, and have checks. And part of that I'll put back on me that um, I did not do benchmark checks this year. Um, so that's that's something that needs to be done. Are you satisfied that you have a good plan to remediate the issue going forward? Uh, absolutely. Perfect. Absolutely. It was almost like um, yeah, you know, you, you know, I finished my first full year on February third. What I've learned in that first year was tremendous, and, and the learning never stops. The, 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 the direction to improve never stops. The direction to um, be better never stops. And, and just as we figured out this week that there was an issue with the cyber schools, well, how are we addressing it? How are we attacking it? Not even addressing it, attacking it. And making a better plan. First thing is we, we put it on our budget calendar, which it wasn't on the budget calendar. Now it's December, January to talk about what it should be. Good. Yeah. Uh, what about um, schools checking in on virtual? Is that included in those numbers when we asked you to have principals? Uh, yes. Yes. Some of them. Yep. Yep. Know Mr. Federman is a celebrity and he shows up on there. I know he's been there because I've heard his name, but um, you know, the majority of our elementary kids are in person. I think that would have been critical, especially in high school this year. And I think that's a clear thing. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And that's, you know, again, identify areas where we need to improve. This is one. We have uh, uh, 
goal setting training tomorrow morning. Um, John Grell is meeting with us tomorrow, and uh, this is going to be, um, you know, and I think Tony, Tony helped me out after we had that meeting in October when we talked about goals. Tony gave me some sheets, and my three goals are main that we'll discuss during my evaluation. Um, and then we'll uh, incorporate that into our our daily life moving forward. And one thing, Mr. Becker, just to bring up, like the evaluation piece that all of you are talking about now, <clears throat> it is this year probably going to be, well, I know it's going to be, every, it's going to be almost every school administrator's goal is going to be to address evaluation because there are some changes that are going to roll out to the Department of Ed's evaluation system, which will impact all school administrators, so like special ed directors, building principals. Part of that um, admin evaluation is going to involve uh, leadership goals. So not only will Mr. Becker have SMART goals crafted, but each school administrator working within a school setting will essentially have goals built into their state evaluation system that tie into Mr. Becker. So it's almost, there's no wiggle room with it. So if that does become one of your goals, then essentially it transcends into a goal for your other administrators. And it's pretty much everyone. Right. So yeah, there's a lot of a lot of changes that are, that are going to be coming out soon. And that's as a result of Act 13. Right, does anybody else have any questions for administrators? <clears throat> I, I have a comment on that. That's why. I, I know there was a lot that went on this year. There were a lot of moving pieces. A lot of us were involved with them. I, I can't overemphasize the level of importance that the board, I thought, placed on this specific area of interest. So. I think it'll be a very different conversation if we're in the same position again the next time we ask the same question. I don't I don't know how to be any more blunt about that without being crude, I guess. Okay. Okay. It looks like we're at committee reports, but Mr. Vogt, you said you wanted to go. We're going to go to the agenda hearing period. The purpose of the agenda hearing period is to permit residents in the audience to make statements to the board of directors and action items on the agenda. Since they all left, do uh, you have any comments for us? Mr. Vogt, I have zero comments. Out on the same, since he. I think they're requesting short reviews so with the after the Yeah. can go out and test one I can put a fake comment in and we can try it right? but uh, everything looks, everything looks like it's working you say the system's working it's working that's a little okay all right can we do minutes and invoices together yeah all right this time chairs I prefer a motion to approve the minutes and invoices and they were from April 12th 19th 29th April 30th okay. let me reconvene does this invoice have the charter school they will. I did not have them pulled out. So for the next next time, let's separate. I'm okay going on it for now, unless somebody else wants to pull out specifically. So I'm looking for a motion to approve action items A and B. 
I'll make okay. a motion. Second. Is that Teresa? No, who is the first? Josh Drew. Oh, thank you. Oh. Sorry. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed. Do we still have Greg? Greg. He's on. If that's loading. Yeah. Right, before we move to items fiscal, we gotta put numbers in there. Right, so we said uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna pay for it in cash as much as we wanted to. I mean. Yeah, I voted I there. By the way, I don't know what my, I have my microphone unmuted. It wasn't working. We're gonna pay for it in cash in a couple of years. It's going to have to be over a period of time because we're not going to have the excess in there. Right, but you've got to have money to pay for it. Yeah, it I understand. But what I'm saying is is that our thought process when we left on Monday was was if we do the three and we'd have 600 k to put towards it and did a little bit extra next year, we would be able to be pretty darn close over a two- or three-year period. Now we're down to numbers that are closer to... What is it, 300? Is if we did the max amount? We may get another 90K back yet that's not accounted for for the those who have committed to return from side of school. But. So what's that amount that goes in there? It would be the index. No, no, the budget and the amount of that's your 20. Oh, 22 million, 873, 848. Oh, sorry, that's down below. Can, it's probably not showing up on yours. Yes, in the public contract. Oh, um, that's And then you have to put in the next number in there. So I'll just go around the room. I'll start. I'm gonna, and, I'm gonna, and just know that you don't, whatever index you choose, that's not ordered. We don't have to stick with that. We can change that at the final budget. But I have to have a budget to display for the public to view. And basically, they're, you know, going to be. So, yeah, so this is okay. the proposed final budget. Yes, and this is the one that will be on display. And as we make changes or whatever, we will. Oh. We have to advertise starting tomorrow and uh, have it for the public to look at. I have to have it posted. Okay. I'm still at 3 5. I would say 2-5. I would be 2-5. I feel that 3-5. 2-5. 2-5. I'm at 3, uh, maybe because we have that $30,000 down payment that's coming up in a month. I know we do have a signed fund set aside. Don't cover that, but that's sort of my thought. It would be nice to take a shorter bond than a longer bond. I agree with that. I agree with that. Greg, where are you at with that? Send that word to get me. Greg, where are you I'd say two five. Am I on? Am I online here? Sure. Okay, yeah, because I my mic was on, not was not it was not muted. I don't know what happened there in that last vote, but I voted I voted yes. Okay. There were two three fives, a three, and everybody else was at three five. Yeah, everybody heard that mic number nobody wants to change, right? Average that out, and that becomes two point something. Yeah, that's up to you. I don't know. How, I mean, did you want to take it by an average and go with that, or it's, 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 proposed, it's, it's a proposed budget? It's the proposed budget, so even the same three, which is kind of in the middle yeah, of all that for now, is so okay. okay, I think. And then we come back and I'm actually get a number. Three. I'm comfortable with it for that. For my three. I was too far. I'm three now. Okay. At this time, the chair is looking for a motion to approve the Southern Columbia Area School District 21 22 proposed final budget in the amount of, give that to me, please. 22,873,848. Using the index of 3%. Do we have a motion? Motion. Second. Motion by Eli. 
was, it was yeah. motion by Cindy. Oh, second by Eli. Second by Eli. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Nay. Okay, I don't know. All right, moving on to items personnel. What, Jim, what did, uh, do we need to appoint somebody? We need to appoint, uh, like I said, we had Greg last year. Somebody wants to make a motion to reappoint Greg. I mean, that also helps with um, signatures and, and stamps, bank state, bank signatures. And Greg, do you want to continue doing it? Yeah, sure. Are you able to continue doing it, making it in to make new signatures and stuff like that? Absolutely. They're all open. Oh, all right. All right. We, we just upload the signature. All right, sounds good. Okay. I make a motion to reappoint Greg Claybon, board treasurer for 21 22 fiscal year. I second it. Motion by Drew, second by Eli. Any discussion? I, I need to have some discussion. Is there an actual job here, or is Greg's signature just getting printed or stamped off? <laughs> You're approving everything that's that he signs. It's already on the books. Stipend of $240. He gets it back. He gets it I, back. I, uh, I'm going back to the school. I don't take it. And I, I don't want to take money out of your pocket. I just, this is the first I really contemplated this idea. No, I've never taken anything for being treasurer. <laughs> Sounds like Josh is challenging. Josh, you want to challenge? I'm not, because if I was, I'm not giving that money back. <laughs> I'd like to get a parking sign, though. Working on that for you, Treasurer. Park okay, the... thank you. <laughs> all right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Zero. All right, can we do uh, C, D, B, C, D, and E, F, G as a block. Was E in that B, C, D, F? Did you say E or G? G. B, C, D, E, F, G. Yeah. Yes. Yes, we can do that. Yes. This time, the chairs will prefer a motion for B, C, D, E, F, and G. I'll make a motion. Motion by Drew. Second. Second by Greg. Any discussion on any of these four? Yeah. Does that count towards the retirement incentive that we passed? No. No. Is no. <laughs> okay. so just a resignation. Is, no. is that a role that we will need to replace, or is that a role that displaces? Initially looking at it, we're going to have to replace it. We're going to evaluate it. More in depth, like just to make sure. Um, I, have, I do have a personnel later for <clears throat> executive session to kind of talk about. Yes, I think we picked a fantastic candidate. I think we had two good candidates. Um, I think Dewey Towns going to make a great school police officer. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. Both, both candidates were. Highly qualified. I'll just add in terms of her F, I had Mrs. Anderson. She was really great. So uh, sorry to see her go, and I wish her all the best. Yeah, different different adventure for her, but it's and then we have a good relationship. She's gonna stay on as a uh, as a as a, an access point, someone we can go to if we have questions regarding the co-op that type of thing. Yeah, I'd say I had a lot of interaction with her. Through the co-op program, the placement of students, and was always very impressed with their level of commitment and devotion to that. So, sorry to see your bill. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Sign zero. All right, now moving on to policy and programs. Does anybody have a problem doing A, B, C? 
the Raleigh value. It'll be A, B, C, and D as a block. Perfect. Chairs looking for a motion. So moved. Motion by Eli. Second. Second. Any discussion? Quick question on the public law extra free horse paying same fee. Do we know that those fees are less than each program actually costs us? I only ask because it used to be, you know, you have basically paid for their own jerseys instead of having this fee. And I just want to make sure that, like, you know, it didn't start costing some sports more than they would have paid if they just bought their own jersey after the I unplugged this time because I didn't, they couldn't hear my vote. We got it, I think, Greg. We hear you. All right, so I, I looked on the website to try and see the total score breakdown. I can't find it anymore. So that's why I'm asking the question again. We'll probably have to redo how we're doing it if, you, if you're looking for that. We can, just that's not how we, we've been doing it. Well, I was um, looking for the Title IX report that had it done up that way. Oh, the Title IX. Oh, the Title IX. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that, that was my only question. Yeah. I, I would like to have that information before the next meeting. I used to know where it was on the old website. I'll look for it and let you know if there, where that's posted. What happens if a student? Uh, is in like financial hardship and can't pay. If, if they, if we have it built into the policy that if they are in free and reduced lunch, they don't have to pay. Okay. So there's your financial hardship. Now, if they have something else, they could always come to administration and administration could waive if there's an issue. Because somebody might not qualify for free and reduced lunch, but have a life altering event happened to them. My, my concern is just that extracurricular, especially within school, I mean, provide opportunity for kids. I mean, if you can't do sports outside of school, you know, there's obviously extra costing besides pay to play, but extracurriculars within school um, during school time help to give them experiences that they wouldn't otherwise need. So that'd be my only concern with pay to play for that is if it would be, you know, stopping otherwise stopping that opportunity for them but as long as there's a plan in place to help and, and that was this was just built into the phrase and costs to help add some um, revenue into the the budget and it's sort of like the pay to park you know we're out making great money great money but if you um if you have young kids i don't have you where you pay a registration to pay soccer and get registration to play baseball that kind of stuff so that was the thought by the board at that time sure Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And zero. At this time, the chair is looking for a motion to approve the 21 22 athletic handbook. We have a motion. So we're not. No motion. Just just with the events that have happened, is there something that we need to put in our handbook that may need to change it? I don't know. Move the table. Okay. okay, just let me, we have uh, sports registration, so we need to get that going. So my question, were you talking about the, the incident today? The incident that you read, sent an email, an email okay. about that's, that's that's my question is whether we need to address it in a I an think, official way or okay. I think what we can do is if we approve this we can always add to it but if we approve today then we can open up sports registrations for the fall and they'd be signing off on this but then we'd have to do some type of amendment give them notice of of whatever the amendment is and then have them sign off on that as well. Yeah, probably. probably. We had asked that Kent go through this and comment on it, and we tabled it last time that that happened. I'm sorry, Bruce. We had asked that Kent go through this and comment on it, or we tabled it last time. Has that happened? Kent did make uh, he made some changes, but I don't think he made any specific comments on it. You said he made changes to it? No, uh, he found a couple typos. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I still see some in here. Yeah. So, 
to Jim's point, I'd be fine if we were to pass this as an upgrade to the current one, but I want to come right back to it next month then. I agree. I, I we, would, you I guys would. gotta understand, they're gonna print this so that the kids get a copy of it. And, and if we have to print an addendum, we can... Just we have to addend it. I'm just saying that we need to open up sports registrations. What Jim's saying is we need to open up sports registrations so things can move forward because uh, students are gonna be gone by the next meeting. And Tim, most most of them are printed. It's it's like not yeah. a It's in family ID, and yeah. we normally have that open by May first, usually before physicals. So if, so if, if we can, I mean, it sounds like basically we we kind of have to do something so that way they can register for fall sports. Right. And if we have to attend it, we address it with each one of the, the players. Correct. Right. Student athletes that. What do you think, Tim? What do you, you're, you're, my problem is, is we had a document that worked but needed an update and some changes. The kids could read that document. Kids aren't reading this. Now we have a completely different problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I can't support this. I, just, that's just my thought on it. I knew we needed changes, but we needed a document kids could read and understand. I mean, you have to have a document like that just to protect yourself, but I mean, didn't we discuss that this would be something that coaches would basically roll out to their team and make sure that they understand what the expectations are and kind of like sign off on it? And we want to have a coaches meeting in the summer before anything gets kicked off. So they are prepared for their team meetings mm -hmm. come the fall um, and going over. And again, they all the coaches have coaches meetings, or when I say coaches meetings, player, player coaches meetings, parent meetings, where they review all this stuff. Yeah, like a companion document or something. Kind of yeah, so they, they, you know, the coaches in every sport, we've made, we've made it mandatory for years. Um, I see where you're coming from, but I agree that it's, I agree. it is very, Yes. Legal. Legal terms. A lawyer. That's a yes. A, a lawyer to, to read. I agree. And yeah, it's a shame that, that uh, it, it has come to that. But I'm also in agreement with Tony is, is that we almost need that. I agree. Because it, of events that have happened prove that we need it. And we were told by our, not our solicitor, but the mm -hmm. lawyer that defended us that it needed to happen. So. My thing is, is I like this document as a handbook. I think the coaches should take it and say, okay, this is the rules, and these are this is in the handbook, and make it cliff notes or whatever you want to call it to state that this is what it means. But on the other hand, I think we need to have a document like this to be able to protect our, ourselves. Do we want to do some sort of training to coaches to let them know, you know? what is in there because if they're if they read it and miscommunicate it you know like we're relying on them to be the ones to sift through it and to be able to make it bite-sized for this, the athletes then you know we have to make sure that they're also getting it loud and clear and that that may be something that what the AD, the ad can take can, can take and make a cliff notes for each one of the, the, the sure. <laughs> now if you make a cliff notes do you give them it is it Mr. Becker, how about this? Every year when we administer our PSSA and Keystone tests, we get this giant manual that tells you everything you have to do, and then we're required to do a local training. And the local training is just like all the high points from the big manual, and then you're required to show everybody. And typically what we do with it, we just we just video it on a Zoom meeting, and at the end of it, we give everybody a little code. I mean, even if you put all the kids in the auditorium and make them watch the video, and then at the end of it, you just attested that they all kind of received and got the information, I guess that could be a supplement. And then you don't have to worry about it getting misconstrued from different people. Well, when they sign up, when they register for a sport, they do go to family ID and one of the things is sign off on the handbook that they've read and acknowledged it. Mm -hmm. And that helped us 
this past year. Are parents involved with that too? They parents, the parents sign off as signing. well, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, that and kind of thing. Yeah, the parents, if they have it's questions, the on, they can come and ask questions. And all of this handbook um, language gets uploaded into Family ID. I mean, how much of a student signing is even actually like enforceable? I mean, it's, it's you're a minor, and I mean, for most of the kids are minors, and they're not even able to enter into well, contracts parents, legally. So does it parents matter? Parents sign off on it as well. Yeah, well, that's my point. So the parents, I mean, they probably sign legal documents. I mean, enough that they should be able to sift through it themselves and read it. I mean, that's my point. It's like this is protecting the district, and I don't see a way of having it both ways without muddying the integrity of what we put in there. Okay, so we're back to, do we have a motion? I make a motion. So to, we had a motion to table on a second. Yeah, yeah. Gonna, we need to rescind that. that. Yeah. Okay. Well, can you rescind that? No. No. So okay. if, if you don't want to table, we'll no. Right. All right. So all those in favor of tabling it, say aye. 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 Okay. <laughs> Did anyone even vote? Yeah. John, Greg, and all those in, all those opposed? No. 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 Not being taken. So we didn't take No. It not not taken. Not taken. I'm going to make a motion to approve the athletic handbook uh, as a attachment board box. We need a second. Second. Second by Bree. All those in favor of approving the letter D. E. And just to be clear, I want to come right back to this. The living document. I guess this is, this is where it's at now, but it's a living document and if it needs to be addended, it will be addended and addressed with each one of that uh, student athletes. Because the alternative is, if we don't have this, then we're going to have to have them sign the old one, right? And that the old one would still be technically in effect, right? It was last one approved. Yeah, so I mean, if, if, they're, if they're registering soon, then our all then... All right, all right motion and a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. I abstain because I haven't had a chance to see the handbook yet. Can you, can you abstain? Uh, Greg, I don't think you can abstain. Okay, then I vote yes. I'm sure whoever wrote it is uh, capable of putting it together a capable handbook. Easy enough for our coaches to read. Right. We'll move on to committee reports. Uh, facilities, we had one discussion, which was the other well pump, and he's going to get back to us with what the DEP's plans were for moving forward there with water testing. Uh, finance, Denise, you pretty much covered it. Was there anything else that we needed? I think we covered the budget. I think, I think we did. <laughs> that's, that, that's it. You're up, Tony. Policy. Policy. Oh, boy. I just want to make sure that everyone has on their radar this Senate Bill 6, 664 um, that could come to impact us. I guess it went through um, the other day the Education Committee and it's kind of rolling along um, and that would entitle some special education students to extend beyond their 21st year of age. Uh, but also it will impact um, some of our gen ed students because it could potentially allow students to repeat the 21-22 um, school year if their parents felt that they didn't make adequate progress during the year. Um, so just kind of putting that on your radar it could cause some grade levels to balloon in size. Yeah, so we'll watch that. We did have, did have one request of, so far to a retention. Anything else for Tony? The cost of some of the balloon and others would be completed shrunk. So we'd have to watch our numbers to make sure that we don't have a class of 200 and a class of 10. Four. Yeah, so that's all I have. You guys have anything else for Votech? I think we covered everything. I think we got it this time. Activities was canceled. Curriculum, instruction, and assessment. The wellness committee this year. I hope they do it again next year and invite me back 
Um, the negotiations and personnel, uh, the negotiating committee of the district and ASME met last Tuesday, came to a tentative agreement that the solicitor is handing to both groups. I think the board may have received a copy earlier today to review. Um, and then we'll discuss that and vote for next month, correct? And for curriculum, we had that meeting uh, directly preceding this meeting. Um, you can go back and listen. The major takeaway was that the uh, screeners are going now to help us assess learning loss and help us um, assess who will be inviting to summer school. I know Mr. Becker covered a lot of summer school info in his superintendent report. Uh, historically, the screener results at the end of the year have only gone home to Title I parents, but they'll be going home to all K-4 parents so that all parents uh, understand where their child is at on these screeners and how they're going to summer and then if we could get a report on the community uh, learning sure uh, you, want me, you want me to talk about it now yeah. okay um, there was a, there was the biggest there were three big things that we talked about first one was staffing concerns I think there's still some emotion regarding losing people this year um, so there was you know their, their big, big thing was you know all years to cut people why this year and you know, I, I went through the, I, the enrollment study with them, talked to them, and I said, you know, coming in this year, you know, there's no different back in two, third grade, you know, with four teachers next year, the same number or actually less students than third grade 2015, so with five teachers. So we kind of talked about that, so it was almost like we were agreeing to disagree a little bit, but I, mean, I understand where they're coming from, they, they talked about individual teachers. One, two other big things, they talked about trauma and mental health training, um, professional development, so we're going to uh, put that in place as part of uh, professional development using the extra funds. And the other, the other thing you were talking, of, talking about is mental health support for students, so we may evaluate that and look and see, is it that we need, um, like right now we have the, the uh, subcontract two individuals from CMSU, or we look at another person or not. Um, so we have to evaluate what that need is first, and then if we need to bring in another person for um, mental and emotional health for students to be able to talk with them, that kind of stuff, then we'll, we'll do that. We did talk about um, changing some job descriptions or some duties to do more of that next year. The concern is, Kids coming back next year that were out all year. Kids coming back uh, who were out a lot. Um, but we did say, you know, we had a large amount of students that were in person all year. So um, we're hoping your learning loss is as great as what it might be thought to be, and then also our students' mental and emotional health. Now, secondary level, we get more kids out, so that might be a different piece. Um, so again, we're going to have to continue to evaluate that those types. I of think the evaluation that the the people who get and everything else, I think they're going to be a, a nice a better assessment. Uh, you know, to see, one. okay, this, this is where we dropped off. Right. You know, from our normal scores to we like, stayed the same or dropped off or you know just as an overall looking at it, mm -hmm. I think will be a good a good benchmark to look at. Absolutely. Um, to gauge where we're at at least. So which of these are geared towards learning loss? Oh. It's what you, you imagine you you know trauma training, mental health training, mental health support for the kids. Staffing. Staffing. Okay. Staffing was the first one, I think. Yes. There were there were suggestions three. on learning loss specifically. They have were there specific suggestions on how to address learning loss related to staffing other than why did we cut teachers? No. Okay. Okay. So okay. The, their job is there's a good opportunity to address mental health with the extra funds. Yeah, they, they were some they were some like, yeah, good conversations with that because they had some legitimate concerns. People coming back, kids coming back. Uh, or still, so Mr. Bayer, one, how long will this committee remain intact? Because this is a. I mean, well, I think I, I think what it could, it could remain intact you know, throughout the length of this, but I think you know after we get 
you know, my administrative team that was there, Jen, Jen and Steph, will debrief, put some things together. Um, you know, we did talk about specific things that I know administration brought to the table um, to start spending, and that 20% is only 20% of ESSERS 3 that we have to spend. So, um, but I think we get together uh, after we debrief, start getting some ideas, and, and call another meeting probably in June. Uh, not too late in June to kind of discuss because yes. I'd like to get going with you know some of these things and, and we have to get them on the on the, um, the the grant application to start getting paid for. Uh, I'm happy to hear. Um, one thing I would say about mental health, like you said, those are discussions that have been ongoing. I know I met Jen several weeks ago to talk about thoughts on that. Um, and again, I kind of echo Josh Hogan and Andrew. I think that. The tangible ways of attacking learning loss. I think once we have some anchoring points with some data, it'll give us a path forward of how how are we going to address this with the constraints that we have. Right. I think the big thing is opportunity. We're going to put yeah. we're going to put opportunities out for people. I think that's, I mean that's that's all we can do. But I mean that's only we can do. I mean we can't force them into it unless they fail the course. I guess to redo it or whatever. But yeah, that that would be great. Seven through twelve. Yeah, but as far as, and, and our, you, you even said our elementary population was, for the most part, in, in, yeah, I mean, in school. Yeah, I mean, 80-some percent. percent. Yeah. Hey, Brian, do you have any other public comment? Mr. Vote, at this time, I do not, and I did test it uh, with the, you guys. I see some board members are in there, so I did test it. It is working. Okay. Any other board comment? Just real quick, since the principals aren't here, I wanted to acknowledge some good things that I saw happening in the last few weeks. Last week during facility and finance, Drew and I were walking around checking out the grounds and we listened to the spring concert that was going on at the football field. That's really awesome. I'm glad they got an opportunity to do that, even if it was a very windy night. Um, and thank you to the prom committee who put on a great prom. I went in the rain to promenade and those kids were troopers going through the freshly cut wet grass in their heels. Um, I know a lot of people worked hard to make it happen and be an authentic experience for them. So I'm happy to see that. Uh, Hart did a virtual bingo at the elementary school on Friday night, which was a blast. My kids were uh, seasoned bingo players and they did very well. Um, and they're using that money to um, fund a family movie night at the Point Drive-In this Sunday night. They're playing Scooby-Doo at dusk. Um, papers went home from heart to elementary students today, and their information is on their Facebook page as well, I think. Uh, Friday night is, I'm not sure what they're calling it, but the literacy night on the playground at GC Hartman, where they're doing a readathon, where you can get sponsorships to read pages on the playground. I thought that was a really awesome thing that we're doing. And then I took the kids this weekend to the Spark Walk down at the track, and I think those kids did a really great job organizing that. They, so they kudos to for, for everybody who is working hard to do all these great things as the URF so. And that's a grassroots grassroots organization just started and they really doing some good things. And the prom was wonderful. They, I, I missed the promenade, but I went to the prom. And they uh, the kids were troopers. It was it was chilly under the tent. It wasn't as bad, but got out from the tent. It was raining and chilly, and they really enjoyed themselves. I think they enjoyed that sense of normalcy. They were all on. I think everyone's on for that. Mm -hmm. Anyone have anything else? Motion to adjourn. Having an executive session? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to stick around, but you guys are going along. So. But we're just letting public know that. Are we? Yeah. 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 But we're going to be an executive session for First, personnel. personnel. Following. I move to adjourn. I'll second it. All those in favor? Hi. Brian, you can shut us down. I'll bring your.